We are live. Patrice, do you want to promote me to panel? Bye. Okay. Everybody, speaker off. Nope. Um, oh my. Could Belmont Media make me host, please? Matt, is that you at Belmont Media? You're now host. Thank you. I was just telling my email address. So have we gone live yet? Yep, we're live. Oh, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Roy Epstein, chair of the Belmont Select Board, calling our meeting to order. At 7.01 p.m. on August 7th, 2023, joined by my colleagues Elizabeth Dion. Good evening. And Mark Paylillo. Good evening, everyone. And Patrice Garvin. Good evening. And uh, a cast of thousands. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, our practice, because our agendas are so lengthy, is not to review all the agenda, uh, everything that's on the agenda. But presumably, if you're here, it's because you're familiar with the agenda. And we'll get to that, whatever the item is, in due course. Uh, we'd like to begin with community announcements. Uh, are we starting with the chaplain? Uh, hold on, sorry. One. Okay, um, as we've said uh, for the last couple of weeks, uh, Belmont uh, has a large number of volunteer committees and there's a constant need for volunteers to serve on these committees. So uh, if you're at all interested in devoting uh, many, many unpaid hours to the welfare of the town, um, please volunteer via the portal on the town webpage, uh, just to give you a sampling of the committees for which members are needed. There's the Belmont Housing Trust, the Community <laughs> Path Project Committee, the Transportation Advisory Committee, the Human Rights Commission, the Pl Planning Board, still? Um. No, planning board, we're all full. Okay, sorry, we took care of the planning board. Educational, Education Scholarship Committee, Shade Tree Committee, Youth Commission, Zone, Zoning Board of Appeals, and there are about 40 or 50 other committees. Uh, there's a link on the town homepage to apply if you're interested. There's also a QR code because we've um, upgraded our technology. Uh, hope you consider applying. Okay, uh, next is a new cable TV lineup, I take it for uh, our local cable service. Yes. And I'm not sure exactly what the difference is or exactly what, it looks like the Verizon channel numbers are different, is that what happened? Yes, the channel line numbers switched. Okay, so presumably it's the same programming, but now on different channels. So if you're used to looking at, well, I'm not even sure that's an accurate statement, Patrice. Do you know the Verizon changed? channels changed. Okay. For sure. Uh, in any event, to uh, get, I'm not going to read all these channels, but the channels I'm sure are set out on the Belmont Media Center webpage. If you're interested, if you're interested in getting those details. Uh, finally, uh, there's a cool program at the Beach Street Center. Charlie Chaplin's The Kid with a live musical accompaniment. And if you've ever uh, been in the audience for a silent movie with a live uh, piano accompaniment, you can see what a genius that pianist really is. Uh, pianist Richard Hughes presents an original score for one of Chaplin's greatest comedy films that will make you laugh out loud and also shed a tear. Together, Charlie and co-star. Co-star. Jackie Coogan. 
Jackie Coogan. Jackie Coogan. Oh my gosh. You know, form, you know, you know, form an inseparable bond that is tested but never weakened. Take this opportunity to see why this time in history was called the golden age of silent movies. And you can register at 617-993-2970 for this program, which takes place on, let's just repeat the date, if you scroll to the top, uh, Friday this, this week, Friday the 11th at 1.15 p.m. Beach Street Center. Okay. Uh, and we now turn to comments from town residents, if any, on items that are not otherwise covered on the agenda. And uh, those can be either live or virtual. Uh, and if you wish to make a comment, please start by identifying yourself. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Matt Taylor. Uh, I'm a town meeting member at Precinct 1. Uh, I'm a father of two. Um, I made some printouts for you guys. Uh, this is, I kind of closed my eyes and hit the print button. This is five pages and dozens of comments from residents. <laughs> Uh, containing uh, support for using the Benton's library and maintaining services uh, for the community. Okay, but Matt, I think this is actually going to be covered uh, Should I make later in the agenda. So. Should I make my comments later? Yes. Yeah, it would be great. And that's what I will do. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Anybody else in the live audience who wishes to make a comment? Yes. Just wanted, it's Kathy Cohen. I wanted to mention that the Purple Heart Ceremony is also happening right now um, over at the Veterans Memorial on Concord Ave. If anyone listening wanted to go and attend that, I think it started at 7 tonight. I okay. think we're, yes. we're all sorry that we can't do that. Yeah. We are as well. Is, yes. Any other comments? Thank you, Kathy. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm Brian Eiler. I live at 42 School Street in Belmont. I'd like to alert the select board to a financial issue that has motivated the Beaumont Midland High School Building Committee to reduce the scope of the solar panels planned for the new school. In their June 20th meeting, they announced a possible $300,000 of new unforeseen expenses. Uh, this would all but eliminate the contingency fund they had set aside for post-completion issues. In an initial move to preserve this contingency, they have decided to make cuts to the solar array, resulting in a 7.3% reduc reduction of electricity production. And they are considering more cuts as well. The 7.3% cut will result in an annual increase of at least $13,000 in the school's operating expenses. The additional cuts under consideration could double or triple this increase in annual expenses. And disqualify the school for zero net energy status. This will forfeit additional funds. This board has repeatedly expressed its strong desire that the school get the full solar array it was promised back in 2016. The board has backed this up by providing $1.6 million to the building committee from federal funds provided to the town. One benefit from this increased expenses related to solar will also, this will also increase the grants the town will receive from the Inflation Reduction Act. The town can now hope to receive at least $740,000 from this federal program. I encourage the select board to work with the building committee to use this windfall to assure the completion of the full solar array. Thank you. The select board is well aware of this issue and the, we're going to hear from the high school building committee probably at the end of the month to see what their specific proposals are to deal with this. So there won't be a report um, at the end of this meeting from, um, uh, no, okay. The, 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 the building committee is having their own meeting to strategize on this and we will hear from them at the end of the month. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, and there's one hand raised. Any, anybody else live? Yes. Yeah, good evening. Um, my name is Rod Sacker, um, lifelong member of the town of Belmont, born here, and I passed away here. Um, going on seven generations in this town, and proud of it. I had my two great grandfathers settled here. Both of them bought houses in Belmont. They came from Italy and bought houses in Belmont, and one of them turned out in 1929 to be the highest tax payer, sixth highest tax payer in the town of Belmont. Um, I'm here this evening, I have a lot of items to talk about, 
but I don't really know how much time I can have. Uh, actually, I, I would ask you to confine yourself to two or three minutes okay. and okay. That's fine. pick out the most important. I can important take time. it up probably. Maybe we can meet privately or uh, privately be talk about some things. Um, I'm here tonight because I Belmont history is part of my DNA makeup. Um, it has been since I was young. I've been a, probably the longest member of the Belmont Historical Society. I still have my membership cards from 1970 at 18 years old and still a member for 50 years, probably the longest member in the society. And I um, take it very seriously, um, the history of this town of Belmont. I'm up and about all the time, checking out the town of Belmont. Just recently, Sunday, they were tearing a house down on Trobert Street. I, photo I photograph all the tear downs. I photograph when um, high school was torn down. I got a private visit inside. I, I document all the history of this town of Belmont. And I could open my own historical society. And I've been told that by the historical members and Dick Betts himself. I have a book in there, in a box, um, um, telling from Dick Betts' sign, The Streets of Belmont, and talking about my history. I was also served with him on the 1976 200th centennial of the town, and I drew the picture for the uh, August um, 1976 calendar of the Belmont. The key word tonight here is the Belmont. Um, I know the Historical Society is planning on taking up residence in the new library. And with that being said, Historical Society is no part of the town of Belmont. They gather the information. There was no town what, anywhere in this area that um, takes, takes residence in a town building. I contacted over a dozen towns. Not one town has the Historical Society in a town-owned building. Um, any town touching this place does not do it. And as the Board of Selectmen, I've heard you say many times, what do other towns do? If someone's posing a question, let's check what other towns do. I've done that homework for you, okay? This, I'm all for the historical society. Don't get me wrong. If you went to my house now, you'd be shocked at what I have, what I've been collecting for years. Um, I have proof. I went to the, um, I have so much stuff here. It's great. Well, Ron, Ron, actually, okay. you're coming up on three minutes. So, okay. is, is, what, what's your specific? Well, you have say, a specific ask for this? Okay. Select word. The historical society cannot take residence in the new library. Okay. It is not part of the town. I'm all for it. We should call it the Belmont Room. The two L's in honor of um, the Belmont Estate, where it's this great town, and I love this town to death, was named. I have that room should be open 24 7, the hours of operation for the library. Because right now, uh, things, the library only, sh the historical society is only like six hours a week. My main point right now is this. July 21st, Peter here, and I, I filmed the whole library inside and out for documentation before it's torn down. It's part of my history. But Ron, I'm sorry to okay. interrupt but, but, okay. now, just, just tell, tell me what you would like the select board to do. To do. Okay, I was shocked. I filmed the inside. I went back on July 26th on Wednesday. I walked in as I do at two o'clock in the afternoon. Phil Hughes, who's the fellow there at the Historical Society, uh, was excuse, I'm just about to email you. He was in shock too because I walked in, my I shook, I sweated, I saw the Nelson Chase, two murals, which are the Mona Lisa's of Belmont, okay, disappeared off the walls. Moldings taken off, panels. Huge panel, twice the size of that screen. And they are the property of the town of Belmont. Okay? Those murals are the property of the town of Belmont. The watercolors were gone. I have proof of all that. Um, I don't know if the select board is given with the historical society. Ron, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, no, I'm happy to take this up with the library trustees. And, and I call the library trustees and I call the library board. We, we, we can't. You know, we can't do it now, but I'm- No, happy, that's okay, but happy to I would like to be proud of it because I have a lot of information I'm willing to share with you no, I, I, to save you all this. And there's tons of stuff that I can prove I, the whole thing. 
Well, I appreciate that, but we'll, let us make a note of all this and get back to you in the library. That. I couldn't ask for more. Okay. But I mean, Mr. Chair, I mean, you, I'm sure you know this, uh, the library trustees have been working very closely yeah, with the I, historical society on this matter. But let, let's just um, we need formulate an answer for Mr. Sager's inquiry and, and okay. report Fine. out on that. Okay. Thank you for your time. Yep. You're welcome. Appreciate it. We're, we're just about running out of time, honestly, for public comment. And I'm going to take one comment from uh, the virtual audience. Sorry, Lisa Pargoli. Hi, thank you. Uh, Lisa Pargoli, Precinct 4, town meeting member. Um, I have a comment and then a question. Um, it seems very disturbing to me. Um, first, well, we know that the middle school, high school building project is way over millions of dollars, cost overruns and mistakes. And that, you know, there's 17 million in charge orders and we got 1.6 from our funds and a million which belong to our roads and sidewalks that are now going to the school like everything. And that, you know, of all the, the field, all the items they've eliminated without letting us know, just west of Harris Field is $2.37 million that they kept the money and didn't do the work. And that's how the rink failed the first time because people then were aware that we were only supposed to have a skating rink, not all the high school in sports fields included. So now an under $10 million project is now up to 30 when we're in the hole to begin with. So it's very disturbing with all of these issues. The um, Skanska's contract, original contract was $240 million. Oh, sorry, Lisa, man, can no, you, can you? you know what? You need to, this is not right. I keep well, getting muted. People don't want to hear the truth. The facts Lisa, are. We don't need it. Sorry, Lisa. This is. Do you have a specific? Do, do you have a specific people, question for the select board? You know what? The public needs to know the facts because you can't make an informed decision. That's the problem with all of these committees. We don't okay, get the it? information to make informed decisions. Okay. Here's your question. Okay. Why, after all the problems, the cost overruns, the mistakes, the denial, the open meeting laws. We, people holding the, them accountable in a special meeting for cost overruns and stuff. Did the, the rink building committee hand over Skanska another $30 million contract for construction on the rink project so that now the, the high school in the, in the rink project are all combined together. We'll never know where any of the money's going because the shell game, it's going from one side, mm -hmm. one group to another and back to the other one. We haven't had so any information at all from that well, school that building. Means in front of the People have to start opening up to the public. Including the rink? Not the rink. Okay, Lisa, we, we will uh, take that under advisement. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure uh, you will. Um, okay, so let me take one more final question from the live audience for something that's not otherwise on the agenda. Um, Will and Kate Houseman of Precinct 1 would like to hand their requests and letters to their town leaders, if that's okay if they put them right up front. Of course, sir. yeah. You can put the, their kids. What are these about? Over here. Yes, these are about the Fenton Library. Oh, okay, okay. We'll, 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 yeah, please leave them there, but we'll get to them later. Thank you very much. Sorry. I appreciate that. Later ones. I'll leave yeah. that if they're still here. Yes. Um, however, uh, it's already past their bedtime, and I oh, okay. that if I could... <laughs> Considering what others have taken for time, I can take my seconds to Wait, speak. No, but the, this comment period is reserved for items that are not on the agenda. So if you have a comment that's not on the agenda, that's fine. Excuse me. So what if what if I um, promise to read their letter when when the time? Comes? We have the letters right here. Okay. I'm going to pass. Glad we took time for we other people who didn't follow the rules too. Um, but uh, thank you for reading some of your constituents' letters, and um, I will email you the evidence-based remarks that I have to make myself. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this. Okay. We appreciate it. What? Do you want to take votes? I don't know what form of Senator Lowe is trying to say. All right, there's, there's one more. Uh, let, let me just say, by the way, it's 7.20. We, um, <clears throat> just because our meetings have been going longer and longer and longer. We do have a policy of trying to uh, um, confine public comments to two or three minutes each and 15 minutes collectively. It's now 
720, but Lois, you, you will be the last person if you choose to make a comment. Lois Fines. Can you hear me? Yes, both. Well, I won't take but a moment. Um, I wrote to each of you, to our town administrator and each of the members of the board uh, with the hope that I would hear back and that you would take a hard look at what is happening to Rutledge Road and Clifton uh, since the uh, Belmont Hill School's uh, connection uh, and the closing of Prospect um, has done and its impact on our community. Uh, there are many stories, but um, I also spoke to Sergeant Murphy uh, and I've gotten no input and I don't believe any of my other colleagues or other uh, neighbors have as well. Uh, the traffic is, is really quite unbearable. Uh, our community was never asked uh, if we had any suggestions about how best to address the need to have the Belmont Hill School connect uh, its pipes. And uh, indeed, we were uh, made aware a couple days before uh, the road, the Prospect Street was closed. And we haven't gotten any feedback in the period of time uh, during which we've had to sustain uh, exceedingly high rates of speed where possible and an unrelenting stream of traffic. Uh, it is indeed appalling. Um, a car that was going at a extremely rapid rate of speed today uh, almost hit me. Some other car hit the rock that I have at the corner of my uh, circular driveway and I have no capacity to turn that rock back to its proper place. It takes an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, strength to do that. And certainly uh, neither I nor my husband have that ability. Um, I would like on behalf of our neighbors who similarly agree that the condition is indeed an intolerable uh, to have a discussion with those of you who are going to be decision makers with regard to the balance of the next month and this uh, choice uh, by whomever made it uh, of the traffic pattern. It has- hey, Lois, Lo I'm sorry, thank, thank you for that. I will discuss- Can I take a, a quick comment? Well- I can also speak to it. But I, I really, I mean, this is a very, uh, we could have a lengthy discussion about managing traffic there. I'm happy to begin that with Patrice, Glenn Clancy, and the police chief outside of this meeting and get back to you. But um, I, we received your email that just hasn't been time to, I think you sent it on Thursday or Friday last week. There hasn't been time to discuss it at this point. But we, but we will get back to you. Patrice has a comment. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we did follow up with the police department um, in regards to this, Lois. And, um, you know, as you know, the traffic management plan that does come into the town is reviewed by the police and the DPW. We met with Sergeant Murphy, Assistant Chief Hurley. Uh, we spoke to Frank French, who's the manager in the construction of the project. Uh, we are going to try and reroute some of the traffic that's coming off of the route two um, onto the access road to lower some of the traffic that's going through the neighborhood. Um, the push is to get this done by Labor Day before school starts so we don't have to reroute any buses. Uh, my comment was simply that Patrice and I have been in communication about exactly. So, Lois, Lois you and I have communicated at the end of last week, and um, uh, I did express my support for precisely what, what the town administrator is doing, which is to try to divert some of that traffic down the frontage road. I, uh, I live in that neighborhood, as you know, and the traffic is, is difficult for sure. Yeah. Okay. Lois, this problem is uh, the best we can do is manage it, but it, it's unlikely to go away, unfortunately. Because uh, of construction? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, it's now <clears throat> 724. We, we, have, we have to open a public hearing for Star Market at 730. So in the remaining time, uh, Jay, is there time to do the 
the uh, sidewalk contract? I can do my favorite report. report. Oh. Could, can, you report? can you do that? Five minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first item is. Oh, I'm sorry, I had stood to make a comment about public comment. If, if you have... no, and it's, sorry, we have to move on unless it's super urgent. Um, it is just that I have asked Sergeant Murphy if there could be a police detail paid for by Belmont Hill on the streets. So oh, okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, so the town applied for the Bass Dots local bottleneck reduction program for yeah. FY24. I am happy to report that we did receive. Uh, funding for this. This is for improvements at the intersection of Leonard Street, Concord Ave, Common Street, Belmont Center Bridge um, that has been selected. Um, it's an allowance of up to $500,000, although this, this construction amount is not guaranteed. We will be assigned a consultant um, that will reach out to the town and we'll be working with that consultant. There's a bottom there? Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea? You know <laughs> do you have any idea what they plan to do because it's been studied? That, that's what I thought. This when I was chair of the traffic advisory committee, we had a plan. A and and I, I thought the conclusion was that our very imperfect solution was better. I will than say that the system. director of community development has, in the past, touched on a plan potentially for that area, and we will be. Uh, I'm not, I don't okay. know if I work with Glenn, but we had a proposal mm -hmm. that was oh, put in job. front of the then select board that was not adopted. So um, there are. This has been. Left. Mm -hmm. So now we'll have someone from the state to look at That's it. That's wonderful news. Okay. And is, maybe have a final, final, final answer on it. Um, and then terribly. my other um, comment is that I will be taking some time off in August. Um, I will be gone between August 20th and 26th. Uh, Jennifer, who will be the acting town administrator during that time. So if you have any concerns or questions, please call. So we can push a lot of things through with Jennifer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and that concludes my report. Oh, okay. uh, well, enjoy, well, well preserved, and yes, yeah, safe you. travels. And a busy year. Yes. Well, that leaves us, thank you, Patrice. That leaves us four minutes. Jay, can you do concrete contract? Four minutes. That's on the questions there. You're doing the concrete, concrete? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, Jay Marcotte, DPW Director. Um, so, at the beginning of June, June 1st, the exact that we went out to bid. Uh, for our uh, one-year contract for uh, cement, concrete, and sidewalks, grant curbing. On June 22nd, uh, we received two bids back out of um, that uh, posting time frame, and the low bid was um, Ensaka and Sons. They were $432,980. Yes, the cost for this contract is um, where are we here? Four hundred forty-six thousand nine hundred eighty. The low, the the second lowest bidder was almost double the amount. Uh, we have used Pacella in the past, um, and they've been going back and forth with Saka the last couple of years. But Saka this year was the low bidder, and I recommend that we go move forward with and Saka and Sons. I looked through materials, I had no questions, um, and you're correct, that was pretty standard, standard annual contract. Yeah. I mean, the other bid is more than doubled. It is. And Jay, do you have a list of the sidewalks that are going to be done under this contract? We have a list, an ongoing list that has over a thousand requests, but we do have priorities based on the uh, sidewalk management plan that we have. Okay. And this would be done, when will this be executed upon in the next year? Um, okay. If it's signed today, we'll work on it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, is there oh, that's great. I mean, it's <laughs> half the price of what the next high bid. Well, you know, I I would like to say that uh, Saka and Sons has been a tremendously good contractor for the town. They have been on repeated uh, bid situations. They've come in uh, dramatically lower, and the quality of the work has been outstanding. So, I'd like sure. to thank them for that. Yeah. And this is an annual contract that other departments within town can use and piggyback on. Okay. Take a motion for this. So I move to award the cement country concrete sidewalk and granite curbing contract for 2024 to N. Sacker and Sons Inc. of Arlington, Mass., in the amount of four hundred thirty-two thousand nine hundred eight dollars. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Thank you very much. Good work. Good luck. Thank, Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah. All right. Uh, 729. Is there anybody from Star Market? Be the lawyer is supposed to be here. They're going to have to. I don't know if they're here or on Zoom. Is it Nick on uh, Zoom? That might be him, yeah. Oh, no. Uh, there is a Nick Zazula. Is, yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice. 
There we go. Good, uh, good, uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, sorry, I'm not there in person tonight. I had something that came up and I wasn't able to make it, but I am on via Zoom. Um, no problem. Attorney Nick, attorney Nick Sazula, McDermott, Quilty, and Miller um, here on behalf of the licensee. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm happy to go through the basics if you'd like. If you could take just a moment to explain uh, why this application has been submitted. Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, so this is an administrative housekeeping item. Um, it's a change of corporate officers and directors uh, for the licensee. Um, you may remember we did have a similar one last year, I believe as well. It's just corporate changes um, you know, with the corporate office in Bridgewater. Um, they've removed a Juliet Pryor as executive vice president and corporate secretary. Uh, and in our place added a Bradley Beckstrom as a new uh, group vice president and corporate secretary. So we filed this application just to uh, ensure that your records on the liquor license are, are uh, you know, uh, in line with what's on record with the state. Um, so we filed this amendment. There are no uh, operational changes, no changes to the store itself, no changes to the layout, no changes to the hours no changes to the manager of record or anything like that. Uh, really no changes that anybody shopping in the store or anybody in the town would uh, would notice. Um, so it's strictly an administrative update and change. And we're just looking to update your records uh, on the liquor license. I appreciate that because this is a public hearing. Um, we need to vote to open the public hearing. Yeah. Okay, I guess. Open, close and ask. Yeah, I have to take a motion to open. Moving over to the public hearing to discuss the possible vote on the liquor license application from Star Markets Company, Inc. DBA Star Market, located at 535 Capella Road, Belmont, Mass, on their application for change of offices, slash directors, slash LLC managers. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, having had that explanation, which is uh, really a housekeeping item, uh, it's a public hearing. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment on the, uh, basically a liquor license uh, for Star Market on Chapella Road? And I will wait a little bit to. Uh, while we're waiting, I have a question. So yeah. is this for the, do we do a license once a year here? Yeah, they have an annual so this, license in this December. This is for the balance of this year? This is for the balance. This is to change the officers on the current application. Attorney Zuzula, is this for changing the current offices on the current application for the, for 2023? And then yes, sir. The yes, sir. It is license uh, That's right. in 2020 at the end of this year, correct? Correct. Yeah, this is a change to that we're looking to ask to put into effect now, um, and then when we renew the license with you all uh, for 2024, it would already be in effect um, okay. at that point in time. All right, thank you, appreciate that. They, yeah, I mean, typically we like to file any changes before we renew because when we renew with the sit with you all in the town and the state, we have to attest that our records are up to date. So we wanna make sure that we're attesting correctly. <laughs> and so that's why we're filing it. I mean, this change has just happened this summer. Um, and so we're, you know, Shaw's has eight liquor licenses in the state. So we're doing this in every, local you know jurisdiction that they're in the same thing to make sure that everybody's records are up to date and do, you, and do you as part of that do you also have a requirement to notify abcc as well yes sir yeah so once this is approved by you your your select board administrative folks or the licensing folks would then send a notice to the state abcc we would then that. have to review would okay. have to review this as well thank you okay. yes sir so this um, this application then is entirely separate from the licensed renewal that we'll consider in December. Yes, sir, 100%, that is correct. Okay. All right, are there any comments from the public on the star market license? Um, I don't see anybody live, I don't see anybody uh, virtual. So I would take a motion. I move to close the public hearing uh, on the discussion of possible vote on the liquor license application from Star Markets Company, Inc. TBA Star Market, located at 535 Capella Road, Belmont, Mass. On the application for a change of offices slash director slash LLC member managers. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 I move to approve the liquor license <laughs> application from Star Markets Company, Inc. TBA Star Market, located at 535 Capella Road, Belmont, Mass. For a change of offices slash directors slash LLC managers. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you, Attorney. Thanks.
Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Welcome. See you okay. in December. Uh, OK. Uh, next, we will return to the uh, MWRA water bond. And uh, for this, we'll be joined by, uh, well, who was joined yesterday? Leslie, 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 Leslie Davidson, our new treasurer, and Jennifer Hewitt, our town finance director. Great to see you officially for the first time, right? I uh, know we, uh, we met her in June. No, we met you, but. but I, she, it was her first day, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. That was yeah. just in June? Yes, 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 it was actually. Yes, you're right. <laughs> first day you met with us? Right. Yes, the first time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Seems so long ago, right? <laughs> yeah, it does. So th th this is an annual um, event to uh, borrow $500,000 from the MWRA, which is the the Water Resource Authority. Uh, the beauty of this program is that it's a $500,000 loan that's interest free and it can be used to finance improvements to our water distribution system. The, uh, it's not totally costless because the three of us have to sign innumerable forms. <laughs> I think we have to do in real time. Well, so. don't we also have to repay? Well, we have to. <laughs> well, yes. My, of course, my, my you, have to, you have to. <laughs> but interest free. Uh, yeah, interest free. I, I love interest free. It makes me very happy. But, uh, Leslie there, Jennifer, is there anything else you would like to tell us about the program for this year or about the form? Um, no, I think you said it. we do, do need to vote tonight, or the select board needs to vote. Um, it is a $500,000 water bond from the MWRA. Um, it's interest free, paid over the next 10 years um, um, at $50,000. Yeah. So I assume that each each time we borrow, so we're playing, we're repaying multiple fifty thousand dollar tranches per year, correct? That's right. So what's our total repayment right now? I don't have that off the top of my head. There, it, it's combined with oh, the interest free, <laughs> the interest free items, as well as some that that we've issued for other larger projects in the past. But I can also attest that we we've paid down a number of bonds. You know, as we pay them down, the new one comes in, so it works out very oh, well so. in terms of its. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So I heard uh, some years ago that the um, older water mains were scheduled to have their, to be all replaced by 2027. Does that mean this program would stop at that time or is this, will this go on in perpetuity basically? Uh, so Jennifer Hewitt, finance director, I, I don't think Jay's with us any any longer, so I, I, I'll, I'll try to answer your question as best I can from my work with him on the, the water rates you know, the, that we did, I do know that that you know the the um, water mains continue to get older, and those those older mains that we've been working on, they've definitely gotten to the the end of that plan, but they've developed a new plan, and you know, the, the original plan was for water pipes that were somewhere in the 1920s or 1930s. So now we're kind of going on to prioritizing the the next round. So I I wouldn't say that 1930s is particularly young. Okay. Um, all right. Um, thank you. I remember uh, our former colleague Adam Dash reading this motion, which I thought went on for pages. This is only one page. This yeah. Morning. I guess the question I if I have I have one question. What is um, so? It's five hundred thousand. Is that the maximum that we can borrow per year? It, it actually is. It is all that the MWRA has um, granted us. So we're authorizing uh, borrowing up to five hundred thousand dollars, but it's fifty thousand per year for the next ten. Correct. That's the maximum that the town of Belmont can borrow. That is what they have granted us. This interesting. Okay, just a clarification on that. We could use a lot more, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, so how do they? Do we know how they measure? I mean, what, is it each community only five hundred fifty thousand? Just decide to keep. Right. I'm not familiar with that that item in particular, but that that has been. I think that's a standard amount per per community. It might have something to do with your your population or your usage. So or something. does that mean? Um, so we have to wait 10 years for a reauthorization or can we authorize a new amount additional borrowing next year as well? Well, that's, it would be an, it's an annual amount. That's the so 50, last year we, a, no, it's a $500,000 bond issuance and then we pay it back 50,000 over the next year. Here some bonds must be rolling off. That's right. That's, that's the discussion we just had. And we're yes. authorized to, we can reauthorize the additional borrowings if need be. That's right. And, and just that also brings to mind another point that is that 
we are borrowing under an authorization that town meeting had had um, approved in 2018, and I think we're at the we're near the end of that authorization. So we may need to bring something to town meeting at some point this this spring, well, in the fall. just to make sure that we're ready for the next round when we go to issue it um, yeah, next fall. next fall. Okay, that's helpful. Definitely help. Yeah. So it's a great program that MWRA offers us, even though their assessment continues to go up dramatically every year. Um, so we're happy to sort of take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth, can I ask you to read the, do you have a copy of the uh, I have the memorandum? suggested motion. Oh, is, is there some, it's just a one line motion here? Is that all to authorize? Well, okay, one page. I can read it. I think we need to read the entire Yeah, it's yes. the vote of the select board. Okay, great, thank you. Oh, and, and also. A, am I the clerk? Who's well, the clerk? Patrice, technically, who was the clerk of the select uh, board? That was my question. I think in the past I've signed it as the clerk. If you look at prior. Uh, papers, but I don't, I think it's fine if all okay. the signs. All right. Go to the select board. I, the clerk of the select board of the town of Belmont, Massachusetts, certify that at a meeting of the board held August 7, 2023, of which meeting all members of the board were duly notified and at which a quorum was present, the following votes were unanimously passed, all of which appear upon the official record of the board in my custody. Voted that the sale of the $500,000 water bond of the town dated August 28, 2023 to Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, the authority, is hereby approved and the town treasurer or other appropriate town official is authorized to execute on behalf of the town a loan agreement and a financial assistance agreement with the authority with respect to the bond. The bond shall be payable without interest on August 15 of the years and in the principal amounts as follow, 2024, installment $50,000, 2025, $50,000, 2026, $50,000, 2027, $50,000, 2028, $50,000, 2029, $50,000, 2030, $50,000, 2031, $50,000, 2032, $50,000, 2033, $50,000. Further voted that each member of the select board, the town clerk, and the town treasurer be and hereby are authorized to take any and all such action, execute and deliver such certificates, receipts, or other documents as may be determined by them or any of them to be necessary or convenient to carry into effect the provisions of the foregoing vote. I further certify that the votes were taken at a meeting open to the public, that no vote was taken by secret ballot, that a notice stating the place, date, time, and agenda for the meeting, which agenda included the adoption of the above votes, was filed with the town clerk, and a copy thereof posted in a manner conspicuously visible to all the public at all hours in or on the municipal building, that the office of the town clerk is located or, if applicable, in accordance with an alternative method of notice prescribed or approved by the Attorney General as set forth in 940 CMR 29.032B, at least 48 hours, not including Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays, prior to the time of the meeting and remained so posted at the time of the meeting that no deliberations or decision in connection with the sale of the bond were taken in executive session, all in accordance with General Law Chapter 30A, Sections 18 through 25, as amended, dated August 7, 2023, and signed by the clerk of the select board. Thank you for that. Okay. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, Patrice, I'm signing because I read it. Okay. All of those. And all the documents? Yeah. Okay, great. No, 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 no. Sorry. Larry Link, did you have a comment on something we either just did or did before? Yeah, I'll go back, but I want to give a huge shout out to Jay and Mike Santoro for the great work on the sidewalks going up Golden Street. Fabulous work, which will make it a much more accessible pathway to Chenery and down to the high school, middle school. Thank you. Yes, uh, that is a lot of work over there. Thank you. Oh. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, FDE. Yeah, we're almost caught up. Yeah. Is there anybody from the FDE who's here? Oh, yeah. Please uh, identify yourself. And, uh... Hi, my name is uh, Scott Tadeo. I am the director of the Apple Run. Uh, we are here to get approval to put on our race on October 29th this year. Uh, we have already been in contact with the police, the fire department, the Department of Public Works, and we've already received a permit uh, from the school to use the track. Uh, we have changed our course this year uh, to stay on this side of Concord Ave at the request of the police department. Um, that's largely it. Oh, so the map that was in our packet is last year's map. I think it shows people running under the bridge and over on. So the old course used to go up around the reservoir and then back down Godin. Oh, that's right. It yep. It's the, the other course is the one that comes to the, the center. course mirroring what uh, the Becky run is? So we're actually holding something slightly different. Uh, we're going to incorporate Clay Pit Pond into the loop. Uh, we've been in touch with uh, Sergeant Murphy over the past week to get approval for that. Okay. What's the distance? Uh, it's 3.1 miles. Uh, we also hold a two kilometer kids run, which starts on the track and then goes out around the pond and back. Okay. Take it, this is a rain or shine event? Yep. This will be our 11th year of the race. Congratulations. Um, can I ask how much money you've raised in the past from this? Uh, generally about 25,000 a year. Per year? Yep. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Terrific. All right. I, don't know. I have no questions or comments. Materials are clear. It's a great event. Thank you for uh, your work. Okay. Thank you. you know, okay. Do you have to run? Yeah, actually, if you could just describe the registration process for a moment. So if somebody wanted to do this, what do they do? Sure. Uh, so if you go to either the Foundation of Belmont Education website, uh, there is a link to go directly to the race. Or if you go to applerun2023.racewire.com, that will bring you directly to the registration site. It's all online registration. It's pretty simple to do. Uh, this year, because we've moved it to the end of October, we're um, going to have some fun with some Halloween type awards. So we're going to try to get people to dress up for the race. Oh, awesome. Cool. Okay. Make a motion on Move this. to approve the request from the Foundation for Belmont Education to host the annual FBE Apple Run on October 29, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. Good luck. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, good luck. Um, all right. Um, Oh, okay. okay, last item uh, before the library is a uh, license for Tata Bakery. Is somebody here from Tata? Yeah. Oh, there's two people. Tata, Tata or Tata? I should ask them. Hi there, Mr. Chairman, board members. Uh, my name is Daniel Brennan. I work with DPB Design. I handle permits and licenses for Tate. Um, also here with VP of Development, Brendan Boyle. Uh, we're excited about this new location at 495 Trapello Road. Um, hoping to open uh, actually next Wednesday, so it's coming pretty quick. Um, we uh, have 78 interior seats and our proposed hours are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then on Sunday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, questions? Well, we've, been, we've been looking at this space for quite some time. We're delighted that you're opening uh, finally and that you can take another minute or two to advertise as much as you'd like uh, before we you, you can't see but we've, we've got an audience here and then an audience online and I will tell you I've heard so many people who are so excited to have this bakery come oh that's wonderful so hey everybody I'm Brendan Boyle uh, vice president of development for Tate we're absolutely thrilled to be coming to Belmont um, we uh, we describe ourselves as a uh, elegant comfort food spot and we're kind of a quick service concept and we specialize in uh, curated uh, coffee beverages as well as other beverages, uh, all scratch made uh, pastries and desserts. Uh, we, we bake everything at a centralized commissary in uh, South Boston, Massachusetts, and it comes out to the cafes daily. 
And uh, each location, including this one, has a, uh, a full kitchen with, uh, with a chef. And so there are chef-inspired entrees that come from a, a place of uh, Israeli and Mediterranean roots. And uh, we're absolutely thrilled to be coming to the Belmont community. Brendan, you'll be offering menu items for uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or just breakfast and lunch, or, or what? Breakfast lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's correct, sir. Oh, fabulous. Okay. Uh, you know, I did some research on this, and this is an incredible win for the town of Belmont. I didn't know much about Tate, and I did some research. And the founder, uh, hopefully I pronounced her name correctly, is it Zurich Bohr? It's Sarit, yes, close. Sarit right. Earl, uh, founder, pastry chef, and creative force behind Tate, started Tate Bakery 15 years ago in her home kitchen some her creations at Copley Square Farmers Market in Boston. And then further, um, she was a film producer, left a film career, a 12 year film career to start life in the US, self-taught pastry chef, cook and designer of spaces and experiences. And it talks about how her work has been featured in the New York Times, Food and Wine Magazine, O Magazine, Bon Appetit, Boston Globe and more. So um, I spoke briefly with Joe DiStefano, whose development this is, and it's just a great development for the town of Belmont. So he, he talked to me about this. I did reach out to him and said, this is a huge win for our town because apparently this is a very popular bakery. It's in 12 locations in the state, I understand, and DC as well, is that correct? That's correct, yes. I wanna uh, welcome you and Tate to our community. I think it's gonna be a, you know, it's a huge win for us and we appreciate uh, you deciding to, uh, to, to place a bakery here in town. I can't wait to, to visit it. Okay, and just to repeat, opening day is August 16th? That's correct. Okay. Wonderful. Well, congratulations. I move to approve the new Common Victorious License to Tate Bakery and Cafe to be located at 495 Capella Road, Belmont. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Good luck. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you as well. Yeah. Uh, huge win for you. Okay. Uh, Next item, uh, and we're almost on time. Uh, discussion and possible vote on the relocation of the Belmont Public Library Children's Room to the Everett C. Benton Library. And I think we'll begin with a presentation by uh, Kathy Cohane to update us from the last time we discussed this topic. And uh, Peter and Claire, come up. All right, if I sit here and I can see the yeah, slides. Thank Kathy. you. Please. Uh, Kathy Cohane, co-chair of the Library Board of Trustees, member of the Building Committee and Town Meeting uh, Precinct 2, but most importantly, a resident of the town for 30 years and a taxpayer. And I'll just say, I know that there's a lot of um, engagement, emotion about this topic and, and wanna spend a few minutes just to make sure to level set about the facts and the process that we've been through. So this is for a temporary location for the entire library that we're looking at different places. And it's actually been a wonderful experience working across the town with the schools. I think Megan Palmer is here, not to put her on the spot, who is writing, is that Megan? Um, writing an article for The Voice because it has been um, very collaborative and finding solutions with all of the town departments, including the schools and the Council on Aging. Um, I don't know if we can see the, the bottom of the slide, sorry if, I, if that was my doing. But primary service location is Beach Street Center with the focus on adults. We'll have computers, materials, and reference services there, staff offices, and books at Chenery. We have agreements that we've been, that we've reached with both of the, both the schools and the school committee, as well as with the Beach Street Center, the, CEO, the Council on Aging Board, and the town. And the recommendation here is to primarily house children's services at the Benton. In terms of, we've been talking about this for quite some time. We were notified, um, and well, first I'll just say, just for transparency, and I know people feel that they don't have the information, and for that we apologize. We've been very forthright uh, at the trustee meetings. This has been topic of discussion. And at the building committee meetings, it has been as well. Uh, but we're all suffering from how to communicate in town and, and I acknowledge that. Uh, for the Benton, it's finding the balance between serving the community, the, the children's service is critically important to give kids the opportunity to touch, feel, interact with books and take them out. 
Um, and so we also have MBLC requirements. And I know when we were here a few weeks ago, um, Peter has done some work with the MBLC. We can meet our hours requirement of 90% hours to keep our accreditation with the Beach Street <laughs> Center. We will use, in their terminology, the Benton as a branch. And what that means is having you know, a variety of things that we offer there. And so one of the things that we've talked with the Benton board about is what do they wish to see happen in the site? And we, we have a wish list of items that we've been able to accommodate all of. But it, the site would be primarily lending and reading library. And there's an asterisk on this because that is exactly how it's work, is being used today. And that, I think that's, an, in fact, part of the bylaws for the Benton today a reading and lending library, and we wish to continue to use it in that way. We would limit on-site programming to five hours a week. Again, that's something in the existing bylaws. Um, if we did were to have programs, we would require pre-registration. Again, something that we largely do at the library today, so that we would be able to limit in-person attendees. We have the benefit, as we do tonight, of having people on Zoom. Majority of children's programs would be held in alternative locations. And that's critically important because that's what drives our largest volume of visitors to the library for children's efforts. We need to have a blend of service hours, you know, mornings, uh, afternoons, and evenings to be able to hit all populations, preschool, after school, and then important for evening for working families. And again, the Benton currently offers two evenings and would like to, to keep those. We'd have a small, small selection of adult books and the ability for adults to pick up holds. Again, uh, a request of the Benton board, but also one that we think is important for the community and some computer use. If we go to the next slide, um, our recommendations is a 39 hour service week, six days a week with an average of six and a half. We think it's important to have a working group with members of the Benton board, the neighbors, town, library, all the folks here, um, just to facilitate ongoing communication and collaboration. It's something that we recommended for the Beach Street Center as well. You know, we can anticipate every, you know, kind of situation that may arise and we think important during this temporary location period, both for Beach and for here, to have those forums in place. Um, the neighbors have raised concern about traffic and parking management measures. And, and I think there has already been some discussion with the traffic advisory board. There's more work to do there. Uh, you know, somebody raised a concern about um, the bus stops and that the bus stop actually lets kids off across the street at Oakley. We need, we need to work on those. And I, I think that the town would be, I can't speak for the town, but I think, you know, we want it to be safe. The, the, the great news is that there are three crosswalks today and two stop signs already in that location. It is used as a library. We want to continue to use it as such. If you can see this slide, what I'll highlight is what's different here in, in the schedule. We've gone through and, and, and looked at how we would you know, kind of blend the hours with Peter and the children's librarian staff um, about what's the best way to reach the community. And we will close for an hour to give the staff lunch breaks. Um, and, and we've extended that to two hours. So when Mondays is an ad, no doubt about it, it's an ad, but we were opening at nine or suggesting we open at nine. So we're missing the morning rush. Uh, but we have a morning session, critically important for preschool, and an afternoon session. And on Tuesdays, we're basically adding three hours in the afternoon. Uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays, we kept those days as evening hours um, because that's what the neighborhood is used to. We've added just three hours on each of those days in the morning. And then Fridays, there is an, an, an add of the of three hour afternoon. We initially, and we have been working with, I know since the last time this group met, um, we have been working with a neighborhood group and it's been Mark, Lena and Diane. I know Diane's away. And, um, and so we have been meeting with them. We've had, I think almost two, two hour sessions each. And it was their recommendation representing the neighbors that they didn't want Sunday hours. So we did change the schedule to accommodate that. 
So it's, you know, it's, it is a combination of ours. Um, the trustees did meet and review this. This is a substantial change to what we had initially proposed and what we have today. Uh, we think that we can, we, we think it is acceptable, and that's a key word, um, for with this hours of service as uh, coupled with programs elsewhere. So I don't know if it's helpful for people to look at it. This was a norm, you know, I, I did, I have been to the site, but you can see the three crosswalks. The one is right by the stop sign. Um, the curbing is right there in front of the Benton. So our discussions with the Benton board is this is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful resource for, for the community. Um, it will expose people to the use of the Benton. The, what we've heard at the desk in the children's room is that the community is very excited about, um, about using the Benton in this way. And, and that we've heard that more people will, will actually use it as an opportunity to walk. Can I ask a, two quick questions? Sure, please. Uh, the first is for the benefit of the public, can you tell them what the two roads are that are intersecting there? Um, it is, it is um, Oakley and Old Middlesex. And keep me honest because I think the neighbors are here. Right? And you may not have the answer to this. I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, when, when this first came up at our last meeting, there was a request for another stop sign. It, was it to make that a four-way stop? Do you know? I, I recall that request. I think you know. There's. Uh, I think the neighbor could speak to it, but I think I've since heard that there are state requirements. I don't know if you can. There are state requirements. Yeah. 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 I have. Um, I've referred that to Glenn Clancy. Okay. And, well, we just um, need to understand the traffic impacts there, right? And whether any mitigation. Hmm. Yeah, that, that'll be data driven. Too, I do think <coughs> to answer the question of how, how utilized the Understood. event will, yeah. will be once yeah. we open it, before yeah. we start doing traffic mitigation. Understood. Yeah. So, Kathy, I had uh, two questions for you initially. Is that what, what do you think would be the first day of operations? Uh, that's a very good question, and one we're eager to ask and answer as well, but we would think it would be uh, in the December or January timeframe. Okay. And I think related to that is that we are at the point where we need to, when CHA is on the line, and Claire can certainly speak to this, that uh, we have no other locations where we can house this. Well, I did want to ask because it was at least, it was asked by at least one um, resident in the neighborhood, uh, why um, the children's services would not be consolidated at Beach Street Center? Uh, space, location and space. No, I, I mean, I assume yep. that was no, no, fair enough. But I, I, but I think you should present the the, the rationale for the uh, conclusion that you reached. Yeah, so, so we did talk um, extensively with the Beach Street Center and the Council on Aging Board. They have a limited um, amount of space that they can offer. Um, and and so they are they are prioritizing adult programs. We think that's the right location for it. It's also an extension. If you think of who goes to the library during the day, it is largely children's or adults, and it's a real opportunity to introduce people in the community to all that the Council on Aging offers. Kathy, um, just a clarification: you made a point in these slides. Um, the initial proposal, I think, when you came in front of us a couple of weeks ago, was 53 hours. It was. Today it's 39. If my math's correct, it's about a 27% reduction in utilization. And uh, I think you said that that it's acceptable. So it's acceptable to the library trustees and to you, Peter, as well. 39 hours. It is. So you can live with that for the period of time that we're. Concerned. Yeah, you know, I, I. It's not perfect. But uh, Peter Strizer, director of the Belmont Public Library. Um, yeah, it's not perfect. I heard from a, a lot of uh, residents over the last few weeks um, on, on both sides of the idea. Many people wanted less. Many, many people wanted a lot more than 39 right. hours. But we came to, we, we were charged by you guys to find the balance, you know, well, find, find, the, find the middle ground. We yeah. appreciate that. I certainly appreciate the fact that the library trustees and yourself, Peter, have compromised and reduced pretty significant amount, 27% in terms of, and I guess we'll, we'll understand over time whether that utilization is appropriate or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I know- Here, I know we're in transition period. It's not gonna be perfect for the- It's not, I'm, no. I mean, it's beautiful uh, for the new library, right? Yeah, uh, Peter Struzero, director of the Belmont Public Library. And I think that we have the right, all of us to refine the process as we go, you know? Uh, I think it's important that we take, take hold of the opportunity to move into the building so we can finalize plans 
and then you know re refine as we go. So three months in, six months in, if something's not working, nothing needs to be set in stone forever. If there's adjustments that can be made for the betterment of all, we're all for that. Okay, appreciate so, that comment as well. That leads to my question, which is, uh, if if there's an evaluation period, there is there a possibility that hours could go up, or our request would come back to us for hours to increase. I, I think the idea, right, is that we'll go in and, and see how things go and see. see I, I guess what I'm really saying is I think we all need to accept that this is yeah. an open process. It could evolve. The decision we make today is not set in stone. Yeah, I, I think that after, say, three months or six months, there'll be a group of citizens that think we should have less hours and a group that think we should have more. And so, so I, I think people need to be prepared for the fact that we might revisit this. And we're, oh, and we're, we're, we're thrilled to have so many people talking about that. And that's fine. I think to the extent that there is a revisiting of it. Well, one thing to keep in mind as well, Claire Colburn, uh, chair of the library building committee, is that as you compress the hours, you're also compressing and consolidating the traffic, right? So spreading those hours out right. is going to dissipate the traffic. And, and let me be clear, my comments did not say that I necessarily thought hours should go down. They could go up. Right. So I, I just want people to be prepared yep. Yep. for that reality. So a couple other things I think helpful for folks to know. Um, you know, there are many communities that have gone through a building project like we are about to embark on. And Peter has reached out to peer libraries that have done similar projects. Most towns have branches, so they can redirect um, their, their volume to that. But the, those that he did reach out to, um, you know, what everybody says, you have some reduced hours and you certainly have reduced utilization. The big driver by having large programs or majority of our programs elsewhere, that is a big driver in, in activity uh, in, in our current building. So we do expect that utilization will go down. Um, I think it's just a fact and it may not be convenient for people. More people may walk uh, and and we know, we know how many people come to the library today. We don't track cars. So we've tried to guesstimate that, but there's, we, we need to continue to watch that. Walking would be a wonderful, wonderful. Well, so we, we've reached out to the friends of the Benton and the friends of the Belmont Public Library to see if we could have a program where you, you know, if you, if you walk five times, you get a sticker and you turn that in for a, for a free book. I mean, we are, we a, understand it's a, that it's a change for the neighborhood. We understand that there will be increased activity. You know, our, our, our desire is that it's modest and acceptable. Um, but that again, I think we've, we worked with all of the other groups in town and feel so great about it. And we want to feel the same for the art. And you're establishing sort of, I don't know if it's called a working group, or at least a committee in which residents will be, abutters will be part of that process as well. Keeping yeah. the communication open, Kathy, that's a commitment. Yeah, I think that is. Good. And so, um, and I think I, so, you know, it's, we we offer that, because we're gonna do that with the Beach Street Center. If this is a town-owned building, we can figure out who champions or chairs that committee, but it should have okay. representation Good. from the broad community, the, the neighborhood, uh, the Benton board and, and the appropriate party. Well, I think we also have to recognize that, you know, some flexibility is, is necessary on all sides. And I, I appreciate the, this revised proposal that you presented tonight. Um, I can commit to the town uh, watching traffic very closely in the first couple of weeks. And if there's, if there's some issue that needs to be addressed, we will do our best to address it. I also would like to remind people that Arlington and Watertown have great libraries and it, it, I would view them as de facto branches for Belmont during this period. So um, uh, especially since Benton has been explained is going to be significantly space constrained with the size of the programs. And it sounds like a good number of the children's programs are going to take place in other locations anyway, that uh, people should consider whether Arlington or Watertown may be an equally good alternative. I just want to make one more point too, which is just to say, and, and I know it's rather obvious, but every dollar that we save by using town assets gets to be injected into the permanent building, right? And that's that's a win for, for the town. Without having to rent station, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I do remember when um, in Waverly Square, the old fire station had a branch library, right? I mean, yeah, it did. Yeah, decades, did. right? Dalton Street. What's yeah. that? Dalton Street also. Dalton Street, yeah, exactly. So. Well, uh, you know, we, we are certainly aware of the volume of emails on this topic, which has been considerable. Uh, if anybody, you know, I'm going to open it up to public comment, but recognize that uh, we have read, or at least I have read all of your emails, and I expect my colleagues have we also, have. and we have been what weighing this issue since this was discussed a couple of weeks ago. So we are, you know, we're not new to this, and uh, but if anybody would like to say something that they think we haven't gotten, uh, feel free to come to the podium or online and identify yourself and uh, try to be concise. Hi, uh, Matt Taylor, uh, town meeting member, precinct one. I already uh, handed out the pages of comments from Belmont residents. Uh, there's, uh, I think, just shy of 50 there. Uh, as an aside, before I start, uh, I would love to chat with you more about traffic and parking because uh, our tools and approaches are inadequate and it's not, uh, it would be a mistake to, uh, to try to generalize or compare how we talk about or address parking and traffic in one part of town uh, versus another. Uh, I think we can add people first and data-driven uh, changes to our toolbox then. All right, so about the Bentons. Um, I'm here because my values are access and opportunity and community. The library is a core essential piece of our community's values and identity. I think Kathy's own presentation shows how the public library has compromised and compromised to accommodate a few residents and to match the restricted hours at the current Benton Library, which has a cap in its bylaws to how many hours it may operate during a week. The schedule presented, for example, early evening hours are irreplaceable for families whose guardians work during the day. We're already losing lunchtime. Based on the schedule that Kathy just showed, kids, if they don't, can't make it on a Thursday evening, will have to wait a week before they can go to the library in the early evening again. I find that against our, our core values. I know you individually and collectively care deeply about our community and have passionately supported our library before. I've seen you be open-minded. I've seen you change your mind and change your opinions based on new information. I've seen you put pro-library and pro-rink yard signs on your property. So I was stunned. I was stunned by July 17th with what I didn't hear during the meeting. I expected a unified select board who would advocate for the children's room and the thousands of children it serves from every neighborhood, every precinct, and every corner of our community. I expected you to call, I expected you to call using the Belmont building a fiscally responsible interim bridge to a bright future. The library is a town department that generates more economic value than it costs taxpayers. I expected you to insist we find ways to maintain or even increase hours from the library's initial proposal, rather than using the Beach Street Center as cover to meet state minimums so that we could cut the children's room hours. I believe the library has a well-earned reputation of being accommodating of all manner of people, items, perspectives, needs, and as Kathy's own presentation showed, they have accommodated a vocal group of passionate residents against the interests of the thousands of other people in Belmont. The Benton Library operates about 16 hours a week. These neighbors, given the appearance of elevated standing and veto power, these upset neighbors who spoke on the 17th never showed to negotiate. Instead, the library negotiated with itself. Um, and excuse me, you're up, you're up to three minutes. Do you have a specific ask of the select board at this point. Yeah, this petition shows the broad community who elected each of you has your back to stand up against these vocal minority residents who have spoken against the interests of our community. Okay. This, this petition shows every generation who's allowed to create an account online. Matt, as do you have a specific ask of the select board? Yeah, I didn't hear any of you advocate for the library or including or increasing hours for a vital service in our community on the 17th. Can I ask a No, I don't. Thank that you. Our community deserves to be heard. Okay. And this is not a negotiation between local vocal residents and the library. It's local vocal residents against the 26,000 of Matt, th Thank you. We need to move on to the next comment, but we've heard, we've heard what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your time. 
Uh, next. Yeah. Good evening. Hi. Um, my name is Brooks Firth Bard. Um, I'm a volunteer coordinator uh, for the Belmont Library. I'm a Friends of the Benton Library board member, and I'm a working parent for a school aged child. Um, I say this only to contextualize my involvement uh, here in this situation, um, but the following are my personal thoughts on this topic. Um, my family actually lives in the densely populated Waverly neighborhood in Precinct 4. Um, we live in a you know, very you know, lovely street, um, but with primarily multifamily units. So on-street parking is a you know, just daily reality for us. Um, as someone who's been helping to care for the Benton Library for 10 years, um, more than 10 years, I'm thrilled um, that through this interim arrangement, the Belmont Public Library will be introducing a new generation of residents to the Benton Library and to our historic building. Um, I feel strongly the town has an obligation to provide full access to library services to families with children who are more likely to be frequent library users. I disagree with the push by some of the libraries of Butters to sharply reduce the number of hours that the branch will be open. These residents would put their preference for fewer cars parked on public streets near their homes ahead of the rights of Belmont families for fair access to this community resource. My tax dollars pay for these library services and for our town streets. I thank the Belmont Public Library and the town for their creativity in working to keep these services available during this transition. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, let me take one comment from uh, the online community. Sorry. Uh, first, first up is Ann Paulson. And let me just announce that given the number of people who are standing, that I'm going to enforce a hard three-minute speaking limit. And, um, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. So, Ann, you're up first. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to say something. And that is that I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to the Library Board of Trustees and also the Building Committee, as well as the Director, for putting together a program that keeps the library services going during a construction time. It is not easy to do that. And I know that they have worked extremely hard uh, with neighbors and other people to make it work. And I appreciate their efforts very, very much. But I would also just like to make the comment that this is a very temporary, I know it sounds long, but it's very temporary in the life of the people of Belmont. Uh, and we all need to pull together to make sure that our library uh, and its programs and function just as they have all along. We can keep it all going. Uh, and I think the trustees and the building committee have tried very hard uh, to make that happen. I think we also need to remember that the early reading for children is the most important thing that we can do for the kids in Belmont and anywhere. And that is to provide them with excellent reading services so that they all enjoy uh, the literary uh, opportunities that are given to them at the library. So <clears throat> it's really important that we have as many hours as possible. I appreciate the Board of Trustees working with the neighbors to try to uh, keep it all going. Most of us live in neighborhoods that are impacted by traffic and have been impacted by traffic during construction periods. We live through it, we move on, uh, it works, And but the library in Belmont is very important to the lives of the people of the town. I hope that the selectmen will certainly vote to support the efforts that are being made by the library trustees and the, um, and the building committee <clears throat> to use the Belgian branch as much as possible for children's services. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, uh, next speaker live is. Am, yeah, I'm Lena Garibian. I live at 12 Old Middlesex Road. I'm a, an abutter, um, so I live right next to the Benton. I'm speaking on behalf of roughly 20 ish people from our neighborhood. I have no, probably no more than three minutes, but I'm one of, I'm, I with Mark are, are, have been asked by the, uh, the group of us to, to speak on, on their behalf. Um, 
before I get into it, I just want to start by saying, especially in light of, and I'm going to read, I hope that's okay, because I have notes on behalf of everyone, um, especially in light of some of the recent public accusations um, against our neighborhood, um, that we are anti-library and anti-children. I just like to say that we are, um, we're not anti-library. Um, we're not anti-children. Um, I've been a resident in Belmont for 25 years. Two daughters who are both here, they came from Boston to be here tonight. Um, well, Lena, in the interest of time, I can tell you that I at least heavily discount any allegations against them. So they're both readers. We spent a lot of time in the library. They would come home with stacks of books, and the house would be quiet for three or four hours as they consumed their books. It was a big part of our lives. We voted for the library. We support the library. Likewise, when the town decided to relinquish responsibility for the Benton branch, right? That was about 13 years ago. They said they would not staff it. They came to our neighborhood with a choice, sell it to a resident um, or turn it into a commercial property. Our neighborhood then was not anti-library. We came together and with the help of the select board came to a decision that we would run a nonprofit so that the board, the Belmont town would not have to pay for the Belmont Library. So for all of you who think that Belmont has been running at the expense of the town, it has not been. It has been running at the expense of the neighborhood run by the Friends of Benton and the town. It has been staffed, operated, and maintained by a nonprofit. My children volunteered there. My daughter was eight years old. She spent two to three afternoons there every day. My husband has been shoveling the sidewalks for 13 years cutting grass, planting it, mulching, all of that, okay? So we have been doing that collectively. We have been doing it in the spirit of a historic building and the preservation of the bequeathment of the library to the town. So we are not anti-library. So the accusations that we are really are um, not only inaccurate, but unfair, right? It's very easy to sit at your desk and say the town should have 50 library hours of library for children. It's very easy to do that. Um, if the town wants to do that, I think it's a great idea. We believe um, that the town should have that many hours during this period. The problem is with the estimates that they are assuming, right? The Benton has always been a branch library. It looks like, you know, 20 hours a week is outrageous, but with the numbers of visits they are estimating, the impact on the neighborhood is huge. But beyond that, it's unsafe. There is no parking. There is no parking, right? I don't know what mom is gonna to wanna to do this, but beyond that, it's unsafe, it's untenable. And this building, for those of you who haven't been inside it, has 900 feet, square feet of usable space. But I'm sorry to interrupt because okay. we're coming up to so, almost four minutes, but please, your bottom okay. line. I'm gonna close it up. So the point, that the, I'll just make the final point. As residents of the neighborhood, and as, as people who are supporting the, um, the Benton Library, we have always felt that we had a responsibility and a role in having a solution. We are here to help find a solution. We just believe that we should be part of a solution and not the totality of it. So are, are you opposed to the hours that Kathy? I'm absolutely okay. opposed to those 39 hours because while they seem like a compromise, the level of usage is different. We have always been a branch library. We have never been a main library. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me jump back to online, Amy Checkaway. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Amy Checkaway. I'm a town meeting member of Precinct 6. I am also a member of the Belmont School Committee. Um, and, but I am here speaking tonight as a member of the neighborhood that includes the Benton Library, which I live two and a half blocks from. I urge you tonight to think about the number of people who support keeping the Children's Library open for full hours during the building of the new library. As you are well aware, we have had to make many reductions to town services and to our school libraries over the past number of years. And there are many things that we would like to provide to our town's residents that there are not resources for. However, in this case, we do have resources and we do have a plan for this critically important town service. We have an almost 100 year old library willing to partner with the town on this plan. And we have staff and an operational plan ready to go for all of the proposed hours. 
So many families rely on the children's library for access to books and literacy supports and educational materials. And for many families with young children, this is a first and primary touch point to connect to the Belmont community. There are more than sufficient public street parking spaces available near the library in all directions. And given the limited capacity of the Benton Library, which has already been discussed, and the fact that many drivers coming to the library would be with one or more children, I would not expect there to be many cars at a time in the surrounding neighborhood. I walk these streets almost every day and there are barely any cars parked on the streets. There are many different streets with many different public parking spots. Finally, I think it's critically important for us to provide library services at different hours of the day and different days of the week so that all families, including working families, have access to a local library option because we can and because there is not sufficient reason not to. In terms of the co compromise plan presented tonight, I would urge the select board to consider ad adding evening hours tonight specifically Monday and Tuesday to the plan proposed to provide access to the many, many working families in this town. Thank you for the time to provide this input. Thank you, Amy. Um, next live speaker. Yes, my name is Mark Caparini. I am at 10 Indian Hill Road. I'm like one door down from the butters and I'm speaking again on behalf of this group of the neighborhood that got together uh, to work through this problem. So uh, to be clear and echo Lena's point, like we support the Belmont Public Library. We support the Benton Library. We support library services for children. Like this is not up for debate. Um, we have worked hard and in good faith with the Library Board of Trustees over the last three weeks when we were first aware of the changes that were proposed. Um, we have made great progress, I think, to resolve our differences. And, and we agree on many things. We agree that the Benton Library should be used to offer children's services to the community, allow them to come, touch, pick out, you know, take out books. That is a great service to the community. We agree that there should be no large scale programming at the Benton because it is an insufficient space for that. Um, we agree that there should be a working group established with adequate representation from the neighborhood to work through issues that we cannot anticipate. Um, further, I think we agree that the Benton should return to the Friends of Benton after this transition period. Um, and less, I wanna say we agree with Mark Carthy who in the meeting last week on the trustees said that the library should act as if they are a guest in the neighborhood. I mean, this is coming from a board of trustees of the library. So lastly, the only thing we really disagree on is the number of hours that it should be open and how we should get there. And I think given that the use is significantly different than the Benton has ever been used previously, and there are risks involved, including those of like child safety, that we should take a conservative approach to mitigating this risk. We should start with a pilot program of 24 hours or of 20 hours a week, excuse me, at the Benton and work within the working group to establish sensible metrics to enable the expanded use of the space and time. We think this is a fair and equitable way for the neighborhood and the greater Belmont community to share the pain of this transition period. And I think I'm encouraged by people speaking out and saying they do not want cut services by the library. That tells me we're getting closer to uh, something that is agreeable where no one is going to leave completely satisfied and the whole community shares the burden not just 50 houses around the benton thank you thank you um uh next is online's paul joy uh, good evening can you guys hear me okay yes paul yes um, Paul Joy, a town meeting member, Precinct 7. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the select board, as we discuss the Benton Library hours, I'd like to, you to envision not just the mass abstract of Belmont's children, but the individual eager students at the pivotal moments of their academic journeys. I have a daughter that's starting in kindergarten this year. This is her formative year. She's just about to embark on her journey of literacy, to understand the sheer magic of words, and the wonder of stories beyond bedtime tales. The library to her is a doorway to a larger world. And so every hour less at the library is an hour less of wonder, of imagination, of frankly foundational building blocks she needs to foster a lifelong love of reading. And what of the hundred of other new students starting next month? How do we introduce them to our community? Welcome, but oh, our primary resource center is inconsistently available. Is this the message we really want to send? 
you know, all of us have busy schedules. I don't want another chore, chore on my to-do list, many scheduling to mentally juggling, wondering if today is the day I get to go to the library. Our library, frankly, should be a beacon reliably shining and always welcome. I shouldn't have to fit my children's learning journey into a compromised 20 hour a week tight schedule. In closing, our children are adaptable, yes, but forcing them to adapt to the limitations, especially when they're frankly unnecessary. Let's rise the occasion. Let's make this library open for 50 or 60 hours a week. And let's prioritize them. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next speaker, live. Thank you. My name is Allison Jones. I have lived at 70 Oakley across from the Benton Library since 1973, so 50 years. I'm an old person. And the Oakley Old Middlesex intersection has consistently been a busy elementary school bus stop, either on the Oakley side in front of number 68 or the opposite, inter the opposite corner directly across from the Benton front entrance. To me, the main library's upcoming usage of the Benton during the construction of the new library, I'm pleased to see somewhat fewer hours of operation than the proposed full-time nearly 50 hours. But primarily, I would like to see a way to keep the intersection safe for kids getting on and off the elementary buses. There are a lot of elementary age kids and families in this neighborhood, hence I assume the yearly late summer repainting of crosswalks at that intersection. Anyway, so anything that can be done in terms of keeping the school kids getting on and off the buses at that intersection, it's been a consistently used intersection for school buses, elementary school. Thanks. Thank you. I'm curious, we give the uh, school bus company a call to see. Yeah, I'll have to call them on to the superintendent's office. Yeah. All right, uh, online is uh, Jessica Hausman. Uh, can I just, she left two letters. I don't know if she wants me to read these. Uh, start with, start with. Uh, Jess, I said that I would read your, your children's letter. Jess was here earlier with her two children who needed to go home for a bedtime. So um, the first is, dear select board, please keep the children's room. It has awesome graphic novels like Mr. Wolf's class from Will Hausman. P.S. I don't have good handwriting, but I think it's great. Well, thank you. Um, and the second one is uh, not signed, but I think it's from Kate. Dear Select Board, please keep the children's section open. And then she has given us a lovely picture of her picking her own books. So we have picture one and picture two. Um, and it was lovely for the children to come see uh, Government in Action. Thanks, Elizabeth. Could I um, finish some of their uh, remarks? They had um, some uh, planned remarks that I was hoping to make, but they're asleep in the next room right now. Um, so yeah, please, uh, if you, please, if you can keep yourself within three minutes, we would appreciate it. Yes, I can. Um, uh, I brought my six and eight year old kids to show you that we aren't talking about a concept that we had people in front of us so that we could see what we were actually discussing. And this summer, I saw my younger child go through the process of becoming an early reader, and a critical aspect of her was looking through and selecting her own books. It's empowering to be able to touch and select your own books. Otherwise, you don't feel like you had the choice. It was just, it was just homework put upon you. And Regulation 603 CMR 28.031F went into effect July 1st last night. Uh, ugh, July 1st last month, which is a mandate for all the schools, including the Belmont Public Schools, to perform early literacy screening for K through three at a minimum of twice a year. And so we can expect an, a boom in interest in early reading families. And already, when we were just spotting challenges, um, you know, before this testing, already 20% of children are diagnosed with a language based learning difference and 70 to 80% of students who have um, disabilities have a dyslexia diagnosis. So I don't wanna rehash the conversation about special ed funding costs or the public schools uh, lack of hours in their uh, school libraries, but I think that having this library open at its current hours is pretty important. 
And it's really hard to look at, uh, you know, a six and eight year old who came and were brave enough to face you, Roy, and others. And they were standing up for others because they, you know, because other kids were in bed. So, I mean, we're talking about parking versus kids who are missing a critical window of learning how to research, learning how to love reading. And I am very embarrassed that the, um, you know, the comments are being made about parking that are not evidence-based. It's a <laughs> building that is capacity of 50. Children are the ultimate carpoolers, they can't drive. So that's a maximum of 25 cars in the neighborhood at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, we're going to have, I appreciate the uh, range of views that have been expressed, but I, I suspect we have heard most of the possibilities out there. So I'm gonna take two more from the live audience and two more online and then because we're, we're way over schedule at the moment and then the select board is just going to have to um, finally uh, make a final debate and vote. But next is Ron Saka, please. Yes, good evening. And Ron Saka, 27 on Moy Street. Um, I grew up in this town in the 50s. I, was at, I went to the Waverly Branch Library from the Butler School and that was a big part of my life. Great memories there, learned a lot. I understand the importance of the children's library. The key word here is children. I understand what the neighbors are going through with parking. But as listening to some of the stuff tonight, I got one couple of questions. Um, is this, for the two years, going to be staffed by town employees? This library yet? Yes. 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 Um, are they required to park away from this library, not at the front door, like other town employees? Will that be part of it? Well, well Kathy Cohen, chair of the Library Board of Trustees, 50% uh, of the people that will staff this don't drive. Don't drive. Don't drive. And then we will make other arrangements to have people so they're not taking up a critical part. Well, actually, Ron, if I can interrupt for a second. So how many staff do you expect to be in the building on a typical day? Peter, <clears throat> Peter Struzero, director of the Belmont Public Library, probably three or four at a time. And again, uh, of the full-time employees that work in that room, many do not drive and rely on public transportation. Okay. That will continue. Thank you, Ron. So please um, continue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the other thing was, um, since this is children's and children's do have handicapped vans, um, and will there be a temporary handicap spot on, on the street there right near the library? For, for the, because every other public building in town has close yeah, access so handicap. That's actually an excellent point. Is that, is that actually point? Is that a requirement? I don't, it's a question for Glenn. I mean, currently the building is not handicapped accessible because you have to walk up the step. No. no. So we, we had talked about it with the um, facilities director to see if there's a way to install a, a type of ramping system to get somebody um, into the building. In regards to a parking spot, that's a question we can talk to Glenn. That's a great point, Ryan. So yeah. Thank you. And um, I'm all for safety and everything and for Children's Library. My wife has been at the Burbank now, longest serving town um, school department employee. She's got an award over 35 years at the Burbank School, and they have their own library, the other children. And it, it, she knows how important this all is. And children's safety is paramount. I heard earlier, why not at the Beach Street Center? I think that would be a nightmare because um, with it, no offense, I'm a senior, so there's a lot of seniors that go in there. My dad stepped on the gas and hit the wall of the building. If there was a child there, and you had ch all these children running around that park a lot, it'd be a disaster at some point in time. Okay. And, I, and now for safety with the children, walking to school. Um, I don't know if you, um, the other thing was, um, you, you talked about like a four way stop sign. I was on the traffic advisory committee, pavement management committee. You cannot, as you probably know, you cannot put in a four way stop sign unless it meets all the criteria. You can't control traffic with the stop signs. Otherwise, there'd be stop signs everywhere, everywhere. Now, <clears throat> the children would be walking here. I know you're all for safety, but I had 30 years ago, my aunt Lena answered up to Penta got run over and killed by a car, <clears throat> the car on Beach and Chappella Road. Now, here's a picture that was taken two weeks ago at the corner of Hull Street 
in B Street, which I grew up on Hell Street. And there's the corner of Hell Street. That's where Antoinette de Penta lived there, my aunt. But with that being said, <clears throat> the town has a bylaw on corners, okay, that it's never been enforced. These hedges on the corner of Hall Street, if you want safety and oh, Ron, Ron, let me let me interrupt. No, 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 we have a bylaw. It actually is enforced. Yeah, and but, but this it's 20 feet in each direction from each corner of the point. No hedges, fences, or anything over three feet high. No, no, we, we know Ron, we know the bylaw, and Glenn will assess this or, or the building inspector will assess the situation with obstructions at that intersection. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Okay. Hey, one, one point, one last question. That's three minutes. Is that three minutes in a row? <laughs> <laughs> it's at the chair's. That's all a great this question. Is, yeah, all this is at the chair's discretion. Uh, we have a one more comment <laughs> online. Is Judith finally? Thank you, Ron. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, and thank you for recognizing me. In a, I'm speaking now as an abutter, although I am also a town meeting member from Precinct 6 and a Benton board member. Um, in addition to Alison Jones's excellent comments, I think it's awfully important to realize that there really are safety issues here that have not been adequately addressed, at least at this time. My own personal feeling is that the proposed reduction to 39 hours will help with some of the issues that could come up. But one important one that has not yet been addressed is the Oakley Old Middlesex intersection, particularly given that traffic down Oakley is fairly heavy and that many, many cars come down that at a very increased level of speed. The intersection isn't safe now with increased attendance, which we can expect, it's going to be a lot less safe, both for children and for adults. And I think that is awfully important <laughs> for the town to consider. The addition to Allison's excellent comment I would make is that there was a suggestion that perhaps a no parking area could be put at those bus critical bus stops so that Kids, little kids can get off safely, and and safety is awfully important. Thank you. We'll be discussing with the bus school bus company just what the uh, best arrangement for the bus stops will be. Uh, let me turn to the last comment. Sorry, from the public, because um, unfortunately we have to wrap up. Uh, please introduce yourself. I feel like the lucky winner. <laughs> My name is Iris Ponte, resident of Belmont, 307 Pleasant Street, director of the Henry Frost Children's Program, two locations. One is 307 Pleasant Street as a home daycare and my new commercial location at 396 Concord Ave. And I'm also a professor of child development at Lesley University. I don't want to talk about being a mom. I don't want to talk about language acquisition because we don't have time for a full faculty conversation about research. We already know that books are critical for learning. Um, what I want to talk about is early educators. My teachers and teachers I work with in this town from home daycares all the way through to your commercial preschools are open year round from 7.30 in the morning, often until 5.30 at night. We need books for our students. And not only do we need those books, we need the staff that comes with those books because I can look at Deborah and say, we need to learn about cats and boom, she's got all the books that, or on the computer and ordering them for us. I don't often spend a lot of time looking through the shelves. It's a luxury for me and my teachers. What we need is very highly trained, caring staff that we've been working with for years to help us curate these books so we can bring them back to our students. I don't want to drive to Arlington, please God, pleasant street traffic would be like an hour long journey each way. I don't want them. I don't want those libraries. I don't want those librarians. I want my Belmont library and I want my Belmont librarians. And so I know it's a big ask. I, I know there'll be more cars than usual, but it's temporary. It's temporary. That's all. Thank you, Iris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Chairman, may I have I have something totally different to say. You, you better make good on that. If you make good on that promise, I will allow you to speak. I will do that, okay. Basically. Um, 
My, my Raymond Kamal from 30 Preble Gardens Road. I would like to, after hearing a lot of the words tonight, I think we all love our children. We all want to have a children's home. But asking the Belmont Library to be a children's room is just like asking to put Fenway Park in the Chenery baseball, baseball field. It is the wrong place for a first class reading room. Now I have heard from the chair of the board that she's trying to find a free place. If we care for our children, I think we should go out and find an adequate place, a Fenway Park, where we can have all of the programming we want, where we can bring all of the books that we want to bring, instead of taking this small 900 square foot building and trying to turn that into Fenway Park, creating all kinds of animosity when we don't have to do that. We do not have to do that. If we want to be a first class town, then let's be a first class town. And I think we should be considering that and not penny anning, penny annying all of these kinds of things. And I think you would agree with that. Yes, the question is where. Right. So, so uh, Kathy Cohen, co-chair of the library trustees. Um, that um, we have, we did examine if there were any commercial spaces available. There are none. Um, as an example, CVS right down the street, actually Tate was going to move in there and then didn't. It would cost the taxpayers 600, about six hundred, six hundred fifty thousand dollars to occupy that space. There is no suitable place, and we are talking about temporary. And what is what what is what is acceptable? to the community to offer the services to our children, give them access to books, and also give pro offer programs. And we think that a viable solution is using a building that is established, set up as a library, always has been a library, is a library, we wish to use it as a library, and we strongly advocate that it return to being a library. But the so, library is too small. Uh, Mr. McCombo, th th thank you for your comments. So we, That's the point. I simply wanted to make that. Think, we, we hear you. It's a fair point, but it, the question is where. Okay. So, and how much? There, there's obviously no um, ideal solution, which would be a first class, beautiful building conveniently located, ready to use as a library. That's what we're building. That's right. But <laughs> in, the, in, the in the next 18 months. So right. what do we do as an alternative? What we have is a proposal to use a space which is a clearly a small library, so small that many existing children's programs can't even be offered there. But it is, as I understand it, would serve principally as a collection to at least make books available. Mm -hmm. It will be open six days a week, two evenings, a Saturday. And um, I, I think is a reasonable uh, opening gambit to see how it works. I, I think it would be very important to take stock of how things are going after some reasonable period elapses, whether that's a month or two months or whatever, to assess both uh, the situation in the neighborhood generally, parking, safe access, school bus, all of those external things, plus whether the programming is really meeting a need. Uh, and if, uh, and whether, you know, whether we would further adjust hours at that point is something that I think we can only address after we have some actual experience with running the building. I appreciate the trustees. Um, I imagine uh, taking a deep breath and reducing the scheduled hours from, I counted 54 hours on the previous plan, down to 39. Uh, 
the 39, I do believe, or I hope, addresses the um, hours when people are most likely to go, especially for small kids, either in the morning or early afternoon, not dinner time, except two hours, two days a week, it is open until 7.30. And then there's Saturday from nine to three, which is the better part of the day. So it seems to me that what's been proposed is a reduction in scale that still preserves the core of what we're trying to accomplish for the next, for, for the construction period. I guess my last question is with this reduced schedule, is the plan still to offer the range of programming that you had contemplated when we last discussed this? Or would, would, we, would we be losing on-site programming with, with the schedule? Peter Struzero, director of the Belmont Public Library. Uh, so no, we won't be losing any of the planned programming because in the initial plan, the large scale programming was not gonna be held on site. What's gonna be held on site is small story times, you know, events with 10 kids, maybe 12 kids. The larger things were not part of the initial plan, they're not part of the current plan. There will be large scale children's programming, but it will not be held in that building. Okay, that's good to hear. Any other comment? No, I think you I think you summarized it uh, adequately, Mr. Chair, and I, I agree with all of the comments you just made. I think I appreciate the fact that the library trustees or library trustees met with the community. I realize that they want less hours, but I feel as though this is a, a good compromise at 39 hours, and I I agree that I think it's something as as we uh, move forward with it, we can revisit it in a handful of months to see whether utilization is appropriate. In fact, to the community, I, I do want to make certain, as you indicated that we address all public safety issues, the school bus matters, crosswalks, the intersections, um, we, we pay attention to that as well during this period. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments. I think to put this into a slightly larger context, although I hope to be focused and relatively brief, I think it's important when we're considering questions like this, not as, as uh, Chair Epstein said, to impugn uh, values or motives, whether it's the residents or frankly the select board. We were caught a little off guard by our last meeting and the questions that we were asking were not to discount the importance of the library or children's programming. It truly was information gathering. And at the select board, I think we try to do that with integrity. We do try to gather information and process it and make the best choice that we can. Uh, so, so that was really, uh, you know, I, I wanted to know some of the history. I'm the newest member of the select board. I wanted to understand some of the building constraints. I needed context for programming. So given that, there are some things that were given. One, we were never going to rent space. We are asking for the town's largest override in its history. We were never going to rent space. Uh, that, that would be a surefire way to give uh, uh, opponents of the override a, a talking point. And, and apart from that, when, when, we're, when we're underfunding schools, um, that, that's not what we were going to do. I also want to make the point that we are asking a lot of a lot of residents right now. Residents of Golden Street have gone through five years of part of my French hell uh, through the construction of the middle and the high school. We are going to be asking people to bear with the rink, with the library, uh, people to bear with other library locations. There are burdens that are going across the town right now. Uh, my experience at the Beach Street Center is when I go there, the parking lot is full. Uh, and I typically am trying to find on-street parking somewhere around Beach Street. The last thing that I want to say about context is that we are going to be asking a lot of a lot of town residents in coming years. We have to, for the town's financial well-being, engage in some significant rezoning. That is going to require change that is painful. It is going to require a common good and a public spirit. Uh, the same thing is going to happen with MBTA communities and the rezoning that is around that. Um, so we're going to have to ask town residents to assume real burdens and make some really tough choices. And if we can't make some difficult decisions here. I don't think we have the credibility to make difficult decisions anywhere. Um, and my final point is that this is temporary. It is a temporary situation. There is no construction involved. Um, it does provide a town-wide benefit. Um, and so I confess that I was a little concerned. I was concerned by the, the initial proposal. The hours did seem high. I understand that this is a small space. I'm familiar with it because of my work uh, with the um, Community Preservation Committee and, and preservation work that's had to go on there. Um, I was concerned about the seven days a week. I do appreciate the fact that the trustees in good faith went back, did some due diligence, did some homework, did some um, outreach and, and gave me frankly, a lot of very useful information. I, I'm grateful for that. 
I mean, to be a little blunt, um, 39 hours strikes me as maybe a little on the low side, but I am going to trust the trustee's recommendation. Um, I say this in the context of someone whose neighborhood is about to be hit with a parking lot at Belmont Hill School. I understand concerns about traffic. Again, I ask you to understand that this is temporary, that we are committed to traffic safety and traffic mitigation in any way, shape or form that we can justify through state law. I, I think we've proven that and we will do it again. But I am a little disappointed, um, and it's not all the residents. We had plenty of, of abutters and neighbors reach out to us and support this use. Um, I am disappointed um, with with the counter of, of, of 20 hours. The, the, that didn't show any good faith movement, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so again, the reason that I say this is, frankly, for my credibility, when I'm going to ask other residents to be making really tough choices going forward when we are looking at the, the good of the town as a whole. So. Um, I appreciate all the input. I appreciate all the answers to questions that we've received. I appreciate the patience with my questions because I have a lot of them and they're frequent, uh, but I do support uh, the proposal that the trustees have brought before us. So Mark, if-, if, if Yeah, I'm gonna try to frame this uh, for a motion. Yes, go ahead. If we're prepared to make a motion, I think it should just be revised slightly to include the uh, operating hours as laid out in- Well, you say based on the proposed um, utilization as outlined by the Board of Library Trustees this evening. Yes. Okay, move to approve, uh, I move to approve the relocation of the Bent Belmont Public Library children's room to the Everett C. Benton Library uh, to be utilized as, as, as uh, to be utilized based on the proposal presented to us this evening by the Board of Library Trustees. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Great, thank you all. Right. Recess. We look forward to working, with, continuing to work with the rest. Let's do the MOA first. Oh yeah, we need to yeah. do the MOA, Kathy. Kathy, you can remain for the MOA. Is Kathy part of that? I think it's, well, it's not me. Why don't we take a why don't we take a brief? Let's do a little bit of a question. MOA is it's a future thing. Okay. Um, we're going to recess for three minutes so that people who wish to leave can, can leave. Other, and then we're going to take up the memorandum of agreement to operate that uh, venture in the future.
We can resume. Um, we're back in session. If you uh, don't wish to uh, be in the audience, and uh, please leave the room so uh, you can talk <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, yes. Okay. Our next agenda item is a discussion and possible vote to approve the memorandum of agreement on possible temporary use of the Everett Benton Library, which continues the discussion we started on July 17th. And um, so my takeaway from that discussion is really two things. One is there is a, uh, I think the door may have to remain open actually. Um, Need to leave the door open? Yeah. Public meeting. You want it open? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you. I, my, Elizabeth Gisman, correct me if I missed something. My, my takeaway was there is this MOA uh, formalizes an understanding that as soon as um, the Belmont Public Library vacates Benton and I guess the building is cleaned or otherwise restored to its previous condition, then the we will enter into an extension of the existing lease. Yes, thank you very much for having me and for being open to having this conversation. Of course. And uh, let me just start by backing up even more and saying how wonderful it has been for the Friends of Benton Library to be able to operate a library in that building for the past, I think it's 11 years. And um, we're very grateful that we've had the opportunity. We opened in May of 2011. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're very grateful that we've had that opportunity. We're glad we've been able to keep the building under the auspices of the town. We're glad to be able to partner with the town now to, to have this opportunity for the town to use the building again. And thank you for being open to the idea that the Benton, the friends of the Benton can come back to the building in two years. Um, the intention of the agreement is it, it, it takes this memorandum of understanding is modeled on other memorandums of understanding over the years that we have signed off on for an extension to the license agreement. It's modeled on that, but the intention of it is just to indicate that you will notify us when the building is vacated. We will notify you that we will would like to resume operations and then we can't constrain the next board two years from now or three years from now on what to do, but hopefully then the Board of Selectmen would decide that we could re-enter the same agreement basically without having to renegotiate all of the terms because the terms have worked pretty well for all of us. So the, the only thing I was going to add to that is, um, you know, I think the existing lease is fine. I think there was a question last time about the term of the lease. And, the practice up to now has been to have the lease run for three years, and I expect we would return to that model. Yeah. It, originally, we ran for two years, and we came back every two years to renew, and then we asked for three because it just seemed like it was had become pro forma. The nice thing about three, we debated three and five, actually, and the nice thing about three is then there's always continuity in the select board. There's always going to be one select board member, even if it turns over, who remembers the last time we signed the agreement. So three years is a nice number. Yeah. But that can be adjusted. Any, all of that can be adjusted if we need to. Well, my main concern is that it, it shouldn't uh, be open-ended. Every lease should have some terminal date that gives you a chance to reassess where you're at. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's, I mean, three years seems okay, but, if, but whatever, yeah, I just didn't want to, because there's no um, explicit language in the, Current lease that specifies a term. It's just in terms of actually the three year extension. It, I think the initial lease had, had the termination date and the yeah. renewal date. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Then, then the, yeah. the, the, the renewal that we, didn't, thing we, is it, we the, didn't discuss the term for the renewal. The, it still remains a town building. It, it is still a town building. It's just being occupied by the right. So, we should bring we the friends of the Benton Library. Um, Elizabeth, yes. Uh, during this period, this transition period, will will be any programs that the uh, Friends of the Benton Library ran there will be conducted in any way? Um, well, th I think there was some allusion during the last part of the meeting to the fact that the Board of Trustees asked us to make a wish list of things we'd like to see happen in the building. So we came up with a list that we wanted to. We'd like to continue offering Friday evening chat and crafts. 
that's when the, oh, thank Chat you. And craps. Chat and crafts. We'd like to continue to do our crafts. Chat, chat no, not crafts, not like crafts. Crafts. Okay, <laughs> for God's sake. All right, I'll, I will just make it here. Out. We'll do all this. Yeah. Um, we asked to have monthly bed and board meetings in the building, so we'll talk to the trustees about that. They thought that would work out. And the chat and craft program on once a month on we'll Friday. The annual holiday. Of in the night, evening. This is a wonderful one. Bed and annual fundraising events. We'll talk to them about having our annual fundraising party yeah, the holiday party at the end of the year. Um, we asked to have information about the Friends of Benton and history about the Benton uh, posted in the foyer. So there'll be history available for people. We asked for seating for adults to continue to be made available. And of course, parents bring their kids, but people also like to wander into the building from the community when they're on a walk, usually. And uh, they like to sit so that they said yes to that. Um, we would like to do joint sponsorship of programs with the Belmont Public Library. For example, there was the talk about the uh, children getting stamps for walking, like maybe we could buy the books that they're rewarded with. We'll see how that works out. Or maybe we sponsor a singing and dancing event in some other facility. We'll see what happens. We're very open to that. We asked for Minuteman Library Network interlibrary loans to be offered on site because we there are a number of people in the neighborhood who expressed an interest in being able to pick up books there. Uh, the library will maintain the practice of providing access to free and donated surplus mm -hmm. books in the lobby. We started that during the pandemic, and the um, response was really heartwarming to that. People come to the library and they get free books, and a lot of the letters we get with donations talk about how valued they are. And then we asked if we could like do special landscaping activities, you know, plant some shrubs or whatever. That'll all have to happen after the building is. Uh, yeah, I think been worked on. Wonderful. So that was our wish list. It wasn't a list of demands. It was just a list of things we uh, thought would be nice. Well, they, they all sound great, but I guess, Patrice, my question is, are those things that are worked out between the Friends of Benton and the library trustees? Yes. Is, is there any role of the select board in that? Okay. Yeah. And Richard Cheek also suggested maybe we should buy a bike rack for the Benton so people will be encouraged to ride their bikes. Yes. So that's an idea. I think that's a wonderful idea. Let yep. us know how we can contribute to that. Yep. So uh, I, I sort of see that we'll continue to support the building, support what, do what we can, continue to support the library using the building. And it's a great space. And children love that well, space. I think the Friends of the Benton Library and the work that you've done over the past 12 years or so, right, have been just outstanding. Thank you. So I appreciate your leadership and everyone that's involved in that. Thank you. I think you. it's continued to be a jewel within our community and look forward to to in two years from now renewing that lease. Thank you very much. I think you've been wonderful stewards of the building. I love the ideas that you have. I actually think this is a win-win in that you are very much heightening awareness of the building and what you do while supporting the library's programs. So that, that's great. Thank you. Great motion, Mr. Chair. Yeah, please, a motion. All right, thank you again, Elizabeth and Kathy. Thank you as well, working through this in the way, Patrice, for your efforts on it. Move to approve the memorandum of agreement on possible temporary use of Everett C. Benton Library. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good luck with everything and luck with all the programs. Thank you. So I catch up with you to sign that at a later date. Yep. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. Quite an hour late, but you can use that. So next is Fire Chief Creek. The Chief has been sitting patiently in, in the rear. <laughs> Um, oh my gosh! All right. Um, oh my but we still have a good uh, audience online. So our next item is a uh, fire chief review. And Patrice, tell me how you uh, would like to conduct this because uh, yeah. I guess HR is not here. No, yes, sir. Oh, Hi. Oh, <laughs> Kelly, thank you for being in there uh, an hour later than we normally do. All right, that's a good statement about the current state of the chair. <laughs> no, we're looking up. that's fine. Yeah, I didn't know if she was here. 
Great, thank you. Ian. Yeah. So this is the annual review of the fire chief. Um, last year, um, we, we conducted the same process we did last year. Um, instead of just the town administrator doing the review, the board also uh, mm -hmm. conducted a, a condensed review uh, of the fire chief. Kelly um, coordinated that, pulled that all together, gave, um, I believe, a final tally yeah. and um, some comments that were made by myself and, and the three board members. So um, it's really up to uh, the board to kind of give their general sense of the, the performance of, of the chief and then if the chief has comments. Well, I, the uh, criteria that were reviewed by the select board members are pretty detailed and I think last year we for purposes of the meeting, we just jumped to the overall um, uh, evaluation by each of the three board members plus the kind of Have you seen the evaluation chief? I have, yes. Okay. I mean, what, what I'm, um, what's interesting is that we're fairly consistent in terms of the rating and the comments as well. So I think we all feel in terms of the great work that we're doing for our town. I know, Kelly, do you want to summarize some of the points that were made? Yeah, um, the overall average rating was a 4.6, uh, which is great. Oh, on, a scale of, um, on a scale of five. Five. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you know, areas of strength or personal characteristics, professionalism, public relations and communications, and community leadership. Um, you know, some some of the comments that were made. I didn't know who made the comments specifically, but I have some comments. Um, you know, the town is very well served by having Chief DeStefano. His plan for the coming year shows insight and thoughtfulness about how the fire department can best deliver services. Um, you know, I'd like the select board to be consulted as part of the development of the five-year plan. Um, because many of the important issues are likely to face the department over the horizon, over that horizon. Um, the chief continues to be innovative, constructive, and responsive. The tensions in the department when he first was hired appear to be behind us and shows great leadership for redefining the role of a fire department in the current environment. The operational readiness of the department is exemplary. Uh, the chief is thoughtful and listens to all issues and concerns regarding his department and the town overall. The chief has worked to improve the department's staff and morale. The chief is an executive effective, excuse me, communicator and strives to better understand how to meet the challenges of the community. Um, and then the last one I'll read here is the chief is a strong leader and department head and he has built strong working relationships with both the town administrator and the select board members along the way with a number of substantive town committees. So oh, I, I would um, have two comments after seeing the comments of everybody. I, I should tell the public that we feel that we evaluated these criteria independently and it's only now that we're seeing what each of us did. Uh, some of the items, they're, they're all important. Some of them uh, actually Patrice would have more direct knowledge of than us. Uh, for example, in interdepartmental inter communication or some um, union management issues or budget or things of that nature. Um, so, uh, I feel that the um, the chief has a difficult job because I think we all feel that uh, management union negotiations have been pretty trying in the last couple of years, and uh, we know there have been uh, questions that have arisen in the fire department um, that I, I think have been uh, resolved well. I'm not sure exactly what the chief sees as the biggest um, issues in the, say, in the next year. But when I gave a less than five rating, I, my comment was that on some of these issues, I was just not as informed as I'd like to, as I'd like to be. So I'm just assuming there's always room for improvement. But, but my opinion is that the chief is actually doing an extremely good job. Yeah, I think the morale in the department has improved dramatically since you've been here, Chief. I think you've shown strong leadership there, working through a lot of tough issues. Obviously, here in the very beginning when you joined the, joined our force. Um, I greatly appreciate uh, the leadership within the community as well and your outreach and working with a number of substantive committees in town. That's so important. And you have a great deal of visibility in town. That That's critical. And um, I think you've built a strong team and, and I appreciate greatly 
the level of professionalism that you brought to the department as well, and the training that you've instituted there, not only within the department, but outside of the department as well, within the community. I mean, I think it's just wonderful some of the things you're doing within town with uh, car seat installation and public videos and things of that nature. I think, I think it's just such a huge plus for our town. Thank you. Uh, I have by far the least uh, experience <clears throat> in reviewing fire chiefs um, since I've been on this job since April. And I did try to make that comment in my comments was I appreciate it, but not applicable for areas where I just literally have no, no basis for judgment. Um, do want to say that I've appreciated when we, first of all, I really appreciate your positive attitude. Let me back up. I appreciate you taking the job. Given that you did so under some really tough constraints that I think showed great personal courage and integrity, so thank you. Um, and in fact, uh, my first my first rating probably should have been nudged higher based on that. I was really looking at one subset of that, um, but that, that's neither here nor there. Um, the chief and I have spoken openly about the fact that the town faces uh, financial challenges and every department's under pressure. And so I do appreciate um, the steps that he has taken to rethink the job description to frankly justify what we need to spend on the fire department. Um, that's going to have to continue. This is not a surprise. Um, and in particular, I think there are uh, some intriguing options to work with emergency medical services. As I've spoken to town residents, that seems to be the, the thing that people really focus on and what they really, really care about. And so I think you've taken some, some important steps there and also to see what we can do to encourage uh, some of our neighboring communities to uh, utilize some of those services so that uh, we can continue to justify what we spend. And it's not that firefighting is not worthy, it's that every department's worthy. You know, we've, we've got a lot of understaffed departments, a lot of a lot of pressure in area, area every area of the town. And so it's gonna be incumbent that we figure out how to um, maximize value and revenue. So I thank, I thank you for the work that you've done. And, Urge you to continue. Thank you. Chief, has comments. Um, do you have any comments or feel with the board? <clears throat> well, well, actually, Chief, if, if I could, uh, before turning to you, Patrice, is there anything you wanted to add? Oh, I'm sorry. That's oh, right. Um, That's sure. Right. I mean, I, I think my comments, as you read, I couldn't be more happy with the, the fire chief and his performance. Um, I think the morale um, has gone up tremendously in the department. Um, his pick of his assistant chief. Um, I thought it was a really good choice. I think he's building a, a great team um, within the department. He's had challenges with, with vacancies and he's met, he's met those. Um, he's instituted ways to make the department more visible in terms of just promotions and, and who works there. And um, I think he's always coming up with um, creative ways to get, get the fire department more visible into the community and what they do. And um, his associations outside of the town as well um, are really strong relationships that he's building and I, I couldn't be uh, more proud of the, of the chief and, and the role that he's played as the Belmont Fire Department. Thank you. If I could just follow on that because Elizabeth mentioned as well, Chief, you and I briefly talked about with the Structure Change Impact Group and know there's an implementation group now as well. Uh, the outreach to, I know you did some of this for Watertown and mm -hmm. I'd encourage you, you know, to the extent you can uh, to continue to outreach neighboring communities to see if there's any ways that we can share service delivery to reduce our cost and, or increase our revenue. I know you did some of that with, what, you know, I think, the fire department chief in Watertown, right, at one point. <clears throat> well, we, we work with all well, our mutual aid partners. Um, we, we support Arlington. Uh, in fact, today we support Cambridge, which we've been doing um, fairly regularly now. Um, and Watertown we do respond to as well, uh, sometimes um, Waltham as well. So. We, we do as much mutual aid as we can with the resources that we have. Yeah, I was thinking more beyond mutual aid because I know that's something that all communities do. Mm -hmm. Is there things that we can do in terms of service delivery in which we can combine with other departments beyond the mutual aid sort of agreements that we have in place? So it's a challenge to do that. We talked about regionalizing fire suppression, regionalizing the ambulance service. Those are easy words to say and very difficult to implement. So there's ways, additional ways that you can think about where we could look for that, you know, I think that would be great. Thank you, and we will. Yeah. Uh, well, Chief, uh, so we all uh, are very supportive of everything you're doing. Uh, so is there anything uh, you would like to address to us or to the public uh, at this point? Because this is your third year? 
Well, yes. Right here. Right. So, um, first of all, David DiStefano, Fire Chief, uh, thank you, Patrice, members of the board. I greatly appreciate your support, uh, greatly appreciate the support of the people of Belmont. Uh, that have reached out to me uh, when I see them, you know, on the street or at an event. Uh, I've met a lot of really nice people here that have taken the time to to meet me and, and speak to me a little bit and engage with me. Uh, that That's really important to me. Uh, and it's really important to our department. Uh, and we try to do the same in return. Um, you know, when I first started here and continuing and can, you know, will always be the case uh, when I'm the fire chief, while I'm the fire chief here, is we want our department to uh, address the public. We want our department to, our department to engage the public. We are gonna continue in that work. We're gonna redouble our efforts. Um, we want people to understand the work that we do. And we want to uh, serve the community by helping to reduce risk. Uh, and helping to address public education, uh, as well as responding to emergencies. Everyone knows the fire department responds to fire and EMS emergencies, but we do so much more than that. And that's been our mission now for the past year or two, trying to get that message out there of what we can do and what we are doing in the community. And I, I greatly appreciate the support of the board, the support of the town administrator, and the support of the, the residents in general. Um, and also, I, I would like to say that uh, the folks that I work with on a daily basis are among the best in the business. Uh, we've got a great command team. We've got a great firefighters that work in the town of Belmont. Uh, we are all, myself as the chief, um, and all of us as um, members of the community are lucky to have this fire department um, serving the town. They're, they're excellent people. They do an excellent job, and uh, they deserve much of the, the congratulations. Could, could you... Just speak for a minute about some of your plans for the coming year, because I was really struck that they're they're outside of what certainly I ever thought of as a traditional role for fire department in terms of community, not just outreach, but services provided and the, the range of services are beyond traditional fire suppression and EMS. Certainly. So we, we're taking a, a multi-tiered approach to serving the community. Uh, we're not just looking at, as you said, fire suppression, emergency medical services, hazardous materials, things like that, that are traditionally the roles of the fire department. We believe that uh, risk assessment, risk reduction, uh, community education are important roles for the fire service. And we're doing that in some tangible ways. Uh, we've partnered with uh, the rec department to offer public CPR classes. We're gonna continue to do that as much as we are able. Uh, we just uh, rolled out what, uh, what's called the Stop the Bleed program. In fact, I'll put a plug in for our uh, Belmont Media program, Hot Topics. Uh, if anyone would like to please check out the latest episode, uh, they can get a little, um, a little insight into the Stop the Bleed program that we would like to partner with in the community. Uh, we have Stop the Bleed instructors on the department, uh, and we want to teach people how to control traumatic bleeding that may be the result of a, a car crash, maybe the result of a workplace accident, a uh, man-made or natural type uh, incident, uh, that we can teach everyone in the community to be a first responder. Uh, and to help sustain life until we can get there with a little more advanced um, technologies. I think that's important in the community. Uh, we're also doing home safety surveys, something that we've partnered with Council on Aging uh, starting in January. And we're rolling into that program very nicely. We'd like to enhance that and make it even more available in the future, where we're going out into the community based on uh, uh, requests from uh, the Council on Aging, sometimes with one of their social workers, sometimes just with members of the fire department to check on uh, individuals that they refer us to uh, and take a look at the conditions of, of their residences, make sure that they're safe in all ways. Um, so that's something that I think is very important. Uh, as you know, we've instituted a program of municipal building inspections, something that uh, is, rel well, is brand new here. Uh, we want to make sure that our employees, our residents, our visitors are safe when they come to municipal buildings like this one that we're, we're sitting in. Um, again, part of reducing, ad addressing and reducing risks. We would like the incident never to happen, but if the incident does happen, we want to also respond to it efficiently and, and safely. So that, that's a multi-pronged approach. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. Okay, great. And those are just incredibly wonderful programs. Yeah, I just, that's why I, I said innovative in yeah. my comments because um, it, it's putting, it, it's getting the department involved in things that just were never done before. The chief and I had an opportunity to meet in March and I was impressed you gave me a, um, a presentation of, of the various initiatives and I appreciate the creativity. Thank you. Um, and again, goes back to my comment of we need to justify the department's existence, and, and I think you're you're taking a very active role in doing that. Thank you. Um, 
Well, great. Is there anything else to discuss now, or do we wait for the executive session? Wait for the executive session. Okay. You hang in there until then. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Unless the chair decides to no, we, we, not move quickly, we're going to move no. pretty quickly to appointment. Expedite. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can go now. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. So our next item is discussion on possible vote to accept committee resignations. Uh, Mark, you want to walk? Yeah, that's ahead? fine. Yeah, I think we have two resignations. Uh, we have uh, Russell uh, Leno uh, um, resigning from the Community Path Project Committee as he's moved to another community, and uh, Yi Zhang Pogue uh, resigning from the Human Human Rights Commission. So. You know, I'll um, first say that I want to thank Russ for his leadership on the Community Path Project Committee, a number of committees as well. I don't know how long he served us. Uh, Sorry that he and his wife um, it's a big loss. had moved to New Hampshire. Um, hopefully, Russ will come back when we finally complete the Community Path, whatever number of years from now we complete it. <laughs> but certainly, Russ, thank you for all of your great leadership um, and uh, good luck in New Hampshire. Uh, so I move to accept the resignation of Rush Molina. Russ, Russell Leno from the Community Path Project Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then uh, I move to accept the resignation of Yi Zhang Pogue from the Belmont Human Rights Commission. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I certainly Aye. want to thank um, Yi Zhang Pogue's uh, uh, contribution as well on Belmont HRC. So does that leave openings on both of these? Or? Yes. It does? Okay. Yeah. Are we appointing them tonight or no? No. no. Okay. Uh, Right, Mr. Chair, where do you want to go next? All right, next we do uh, appointments and reappointments. Um, just following the order on the agenda, the first is Council on Aging. And uh, let's just read this carefully so we uh, get the number of appointments right. Uh, so Ted Dugas would like to be reappointed. Tommy Olson would like to be reappointed. Marjorie Wayne is not seeking reappointment. Uh, and there's only one new applicant. Of, Peg Callanan. So. But a fabulous applicant. I think that absolutely is a fabulous applicant. Yeah. Great to see Peg go yeah, interested in the COA. I'm thrilled. Yeah. I mean, served on this board for very limited time. It does important work for our seniors in town, and I think we have a, a terrific team here. Yeah, Peg is great. I think, I think um, for people who don't know Peg, she's a, a quiet force in town. No, I think she's well informed, former school committee member. I mean, she's had great experience on the Warren Committee. I've served with her on the yeah. Warren Committee, and I think she'll bring a lot of uh, energy and and uh, thoughtfulness to uh, see a way, which is such an important uh, committee in our community. So, Mr. Chair, you want me to move forward with some Please. of these? So, uh, I'll first start with, uh, first I want to thank uh, Marjorie Wayne. I think you just did that for uh, her service on the, on the Council on Aging Board. But I'll move to reappoint uh, Theodore um, Dukas to three-year term to expire 632, 2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, um, I move to reappoint Thomasina Olson to a three year term to expire 630 2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And finally, I move to appoint Margaret Callanan to a three year term to expire 630 2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, next is Division 21. And uh, here we have uh, <clears throat> Brian Antonellis. Uh, is seeking reappointment. Uh, Amy Kirsch is not seeking reappointment. We need to appoint somebody. And Gang Zhao uh, is seeking reappointment. And we have three candidates. So, so you want me to do reappointments first? Yes. Okay, I move to reappoint Brian Antonellis to a three year term to expire 630 2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to reappoint Yang Zhao to a three-year term to expire 6-30-2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a recommendation here. I don't know who recommended this to appoint uh, Aaron Lubian, which I would support, uh, to take uh, Amy Kirsch's seat. Uh, but there are three, two other applicants. Mr. Chair. Want me to come from the chair? Yeah, Taylor, 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 Taylor Yates. Taylor Yates, Taylor Yates uh, did recommend that we uh, consider Erin Lubin. And, and we have typically given great deference to chair recommendations. I think Erin has a background in business and she's knowledgeable. She's incredibly involved. Very active in Precinct 7. And I uh, certainly want to thank Susan Montoya and Allison Lang for their interest. Um, but I would support Erin Lubin's appointment. Is there a motion? I move to appoint uh, candidate. Candidate, I move to appoint candidate Eric Lubian to a three year term to expire 630 2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, and uh, let me repeat what we always say on these occasions that uh, 
even if somebody was not selected, we hope they still keep their head in the ring because there are plenty of other committees that could use people. To, uh, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I know Allison personally, I think should be an asset to a number of committees, so. So the next one on the agenda is the um, uh, election workers. And this one is a little unusual, so let me, uh, explain it as I understand it, subject to uh, clarification from Patrice. Um, there appears to be a state statute that requires uh, select boards in town to appoint election workers every year. For some unknown reason, we haven't done that. And I gather from Ellen Cushman that many towns haven't done that. Um, so certainly in the time I've been on the select board, we have not done, Never done, done the 12 years I've been on. No. Yeah, and, and even Ellen Cushman, who has been clerk now for a good long time, doesn't recall the select board ever doing that. Nonetheless, that is the law. So we all reviewed the bylaw and consulted with George Hall Town Council. And uh, it's our understanding is that for election workers in a town, the Democratic Town Committee and the Republican Town Committee submit lists of suitable people. Be suitable means that you need to actually have some level of training that you get from the town clerk in how to be an election worker. And there are different levels of election worker. I think the titles are inspector, uh, I forget the second one, and then there's warden, warden, and clerk. Um, but the, it's the primary. Uh, it, it originates with the Democratic and Republican town committees, and Belmont has one of each, uh, compiling lists, basically of volunteers of registered voters of those parties who indicate a willingness to serve as an election worker. And the select board makes appointments off those lists. Uh, it turns out that uh, there are, the lists are not long enough to fill every required position of election, of election worker, principally because in Belmont at this point, more than 50% of the voters are unaffiliated and don't have a a party affiliation, which would put them on either the Democratic list or the Republican list. So my own view, which uh, I'm happy to discuss with my colleagues, is that uh, the select board actually, regardless of the state statute, the select board does not have particular expertise in identifying candidates to be election workers. That is something that the Board of Registrars does and it's something that the town clerk does. And that they've done well. Well, and they've done well. So what I would recommend is that the select board uh, take the minimum action necessary to comply with state statute. And then if additional workers are needed, who in this case would be drawn from Enroll. the unenrolled, let that uh, be done by the town clerk working with the board of registrars because statute allows that as a, as a mechanism to go forward. I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. You answered the one question I have, which is if the statute allows it, I think that makes a lot of sense. So if we don't, it, so we could accept the, the, um, the party the, recommendation. The acceptance of the both Democratic and Republican Party yes. recommendation as election workers and uh, and then registrars to the extent needed would fill many gaps without enrollment. Okay. And I, I know that Ellen O'Brien Cushman has joined us. If Ellen, if you would like to comment any further on what I said, that would be great. Sure, thanks. It's uh, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, I'm the town clerk and a member of the Board of Registrars. Uh, yes, the answer is uh, that the new Votes Act, which was passed in June of 2022, allows um, you know, sort of a safety net that if the Board of Selectmen and select boards in communities don't do all of the uh, appointments as required, then the Board of Registrars um, within six weeks of the election can fill 
um, any open slots. And if there are still open slots within three weeks of the election, the town clerk can do that exclusively and appoint anybody who isn't even a registered voter of the town. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, given the exemplary job you've always done with elections, I would really love to let you have as much uh, authority as we can legally allow you to have here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I, I would tell you if I could give a plug. Nancy Casali in my office does all of the kind of uh, airline scheduling involving all these election workers, and it is no small task with everybody's many, schedules. Workers, yeah, I think Nancy does a great job. How many workers do you typically have per election? 96. 96. Wow. Yeah. Um, a number of years ago, probably 2012, um, I put a proposal to the registrars um, who accepted it that uh, instead of using all election workers all day, which for us means from six in the morning, at least till nine at night, um, that we split those shifts into six at six to one and one to close. And that has allowed us to not just multiply the number of people who are involved, but also have sort of fresh minds when the end of the day comes. It's a very long and arduous day. So um, we think that that made a big difference in terms of being able to recruit election workers and have people be interested and, and trained well. And um, so we're, we're happy that the Democratic and Republican parties have this year provided uh, some lists. We gave them all the lists of all of our election workers, as you probably know, and um, they were able to add, each one was able to add, um, the Democratic Party, I think, added eight or nine, and the Republicans were unenrolled. We also have eight or nine new ones. So um, we're looking pretty good for 2024. Yeah, Ellen, I did want to call out uh, or, or thank the uh, new people who have stepped forward to be election workers, because I count, yeah. I count 15 on your lists here. That's right. Yeah. Um, and they're, most of the election workers, um, what they tell us is that they appreciate it's a really extraordinary civics lesson that they perhaps have not ever gotten in their lives. And uh, so we're grateful that they're enthusiastic, happy to serve. It's a great place to meet new people and uh, and get to know your, your town. So how do we, do we, so we received the list of names yes. from for the Democratic and Republican town committees. Do we have to read all of these names in order to make these appointments? Well, I think that uh, the Greece can... Yeah, I think it's just as presented by the town clerk. So okay. is, is this, are we well, it's actually not or presented we... by me. The oh, process the was that the parties, yeah, um, no, the list respect. went to the Board of Registrars of Voters for qualification. The, the Board of Registrars of Voters then turned it over to you. you. And the list that I sent you is just uh, simply reformatted okay, right. to make the vote Got easier. It, yeah. So, so I think it's a motion to um, to appoint. I, I think it's a motion for each. You know, uh, you know, I move to appoint the um, the list of election offices poll workers as presented uh, to the select board by the Democratic Town Committee of Belmont and the Republican Town Committee. Um, and the Republican Town Committee of Belmont. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. I was going to do separate motions, yeah. but that's fine. Okay. And so that list will be provided to the board of registrars and to the town clerk or to the That's Ellen. right. Now it's to you, Ellen, now it's right? Ellen. So we've appointed them to the now official. Right. And now the process of scheduling them could begin okay. our next right. election. I'm going to give a plug. Our next election is the primary, the presidential primary on March 4th, uh, 5th of 2024, followed by the April town election. And uh, these people will serve uh, based on your appointment today through only uh, July 14th or July 15th of next year, whenever you do the appointments for next year, which would okay. apply for the fall elections. Ellen, thank you. I forgot about the primary. Of course, there was a primary. <laughs> all right, Ellen, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you, it. Yeah, all the best. All right. Uh, next is appointments to the MWRA Advisory Committee. And we have uh, two candidates, and both are seeking reappointment. Let me just get that. Hang on. So I move to reappoint Jason Marcott as a full member to a one-year term to the MWRA Advisory Committee, uh, term expiring 6-30-2024. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to reappoint Mark Mancuso as an associate member to the MWRA Advisory Committee to a one-year term expiring 6-30-2024. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, Recommission. Lord. Recommission. Uh, 
Honestly, uh, these, these are all fabulous people. Yeah, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, in enthusiastic in about Mike Capitani. Well, let me just uh, recap what we have here. Courtney Eldridge is seeking reappointment. Anthony Ferrante is seeking reappointment. Uh, David, do we appoint David Lynn? That's a CPC. No, he. they decide that he's a CPA. We appoint him to the rec commission. They decide who their liaison is to the CPC. So oh, we that's the, right. We do the appointment and then oh, we do okay. the that, liaison. That's right. That makes yeah, sense. Right. Okay, so David Lynn is seeking reappointment. And then we have a vacancy with one candidate. So this should be simple. So I move to reappoint Courtney Eldridge to a three-year term to expire 6-30-2026. On the Recreation Commission. To the Recreation Commission. Thank you. Elizabeth. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I still want to... It's a late evening. Yes. I move to reappoint Anthony Ferrante to the Recreation Commission to a three-year term to expire 6-30-2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I move to reappoint David Lynn to the Recreation Commission <laughs> to a three-year term to expire 6 6 Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Finally, I move to appoint Michael Capitani to the Recreation Commission to a one-year term to expire 6 Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Filling uh, Colello's vacancy. And, and thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> greatly, greatly appreciated. All right, then final appointments to water advisory board. We have uh, one member, Frank French, seeking reappointment, and there is no other applicant. Yeah, I want to thank Frank and Joseph Burrell and William Shea. They've served for an extensive period of time and they've done great work. So I move to reappoint Frank French to the water advisory board for a three year term to expire 6 30, 2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, there was no other business not anticipated by the chair, so we can now enter our uh, move to enter our executive. You want to do the minutes, Mr. Chair? Oh, and the evening. Uh, so, oh, we have to come on to ratification. Only if you settle. I we put it there on the off chance that you was to settle the co any contract negotiations with the chief. But if, if we settle the contract, we have to come back in open yes. session and vote it. So. That's right. Well, we can do minutes now. It should be quick. Okay. Um, all right. We have some amendments here. Maybe you both can sort of. So, so the challenge is that Roy and I both had changes to the June 26 minutes, uh, most of which were correcting spellings of names, uh, which is not to impugn our minute taker because she doesn't know these people and we do. So those were easy corrections. But the significant one was that I had um, voted against the, uh, the decision to um, change the bike path in front of the post office. Um, and so that was the one change that we made. I had sent, uh, Roy had made corrections. I made corrections on Roy's corrections and then sent them around, but those were not the ones that got distributed. So I redistributed those this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that, that's fine. Uh, where is the change, Elizabeth? So. Where is this more substantive change? The only substantive change is. Um, you didn't vote. It was a two-one vote, if I recall. So the, the only substantive change is. Let me find it. Page five. Uh, where it says the motion was seconded. Um, you know what? I'm going to pull up because I've got it right here. Let me let me show you. Let me read what I. Yeah, said. you said Ms. Dion was opposed. Uh, to one vote. That was the change. Yeah, but she, even what she did, she inadvertently delete passed. So, so we need to use my version, which is actually grammatically correct. Let me find it and I can tell you exactly what it says. And she has a copy of this. Pam Callahan has a copy of this. So I'll just read it and then we can get through it. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just, it's taking right. a minute to open. Is it this one in red here? Because I printed off what you sent. Oh, it may be. It yeah, may be. Right. So what it says in red is, the motion was seconded and passed by a two to one vote. Mr. Epstein and Mr. Palillo voted in favor. Ms. Dion was opposed. That's right. the one that you agree yeah. with. Yeah, that's the okay, one that I said. That's fine. Yeah, so I that, that's the only substantive change. The rest I'm were going all. to approve the June 20, 20, June 26, 2023 regular session minutes of the select board as amended by uh, Roy Epstein and Ms. Dion. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, and then the others are quick for. Uh, July 10th, uh, the copy we got had Ron with a question mark for last name, but that, I, I double checked All the right. video, that was Ron Sacker. So I moved to appoint, I moved to approve the 
June 10, 2023, regular session uh, select board minutes as amended by Lori Epstein. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, the January 19th public oh. forum. Uh, why is that, that? Why haven't we done that? Uh, I don't know. So I have to stay on this. Each will have to. Why didn't we do that one? one? I thought we didn't do that one. Which public forum was that? I, I think it was the treasurer. It was the treasurer's forum. Treasurer. Transition from elected to appointed to the treasurer's license. Did you look at them? Because yeah, it, seemed, but it was all recording public. All right, so I move to to approve the January 19, twenty twenty three, um, public forum select board minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Okay. And then July seventeenth. Yeah. So you let me just some, you run some through edits and email you. Some edits. Yeah, actually, it would be helpful in the future to um, receive the minutes as a Word document because I don't have. Um, yeah, I'm sending around an email to that effect today, apologizing for them coming out as PDFs and said they'll come out as words. So, do, do, does uh, Susan, Susan does have these changes, right? Yeah. She was so coming. So, when we, let me question, I'm sure I know the answer to this. It's an obvious question. When we vote amend it and we get, you know, red line and blue line minutes and email minutes, Susan will then update the minutes yes. for submission to the town clerk? Correct. And Pam does keep close track of, of what these Pam keep, keeps track of the changes that the changes we recommended. That you <clears throat> yeah, fine. So we don't need to look at them again. Because typically you amend and you, you wait for the amended minutes to come to you and then approve, but okay. process is as stated. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Did you have any changes, Melissa? Uh One super minor one, page two, line four, about in the top quarter. It should be Miss Garvin, not Miss Gavin. Did you provide that? To no, some? wait, for July 17th? For July 17th. Just look at spelled uh, see if you can find Gavin. It's page two. Did you oh, send the, the line numbers here are unique, so which they're not. Go so five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four from the top. So there. Oh well, I, what I see in PDF is different. Um. <coughs> um, I was reading. Um, are you on page two? Yeah, you are. Oh. Huh. All right. Uh, What's the, what's the yeah, what's so you the, do have actual correct. It doesn't matter, it's right there. So it's line. Oh, it's, it's line 44. 44. So I don't know why we have different versions, but your lines make sense, mine don't. Oh, so that oh, so should be Miss Garvin. Miss Garvin. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good catch. Can't help myself. All right, so I move to approve the, the uh, July 17, 2023 regular session select board minutes as amended by Roy Epstein and Roy Epstein. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. So we're going to take a motion. Yeah, we're going into executive session. Let me find it. We need to read the reasons for doing so. Yes. Do. So uh, I'd like to uh, make a motion to go into executive session to conduct. I move that we move into we go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel related to the Belmont Police Superior Officers Association and the Belmont Fire Chief. Second. Uh, and we have to do a roll call. Yeah, we, we, and we expect and we, to return to public session. Anticipate, yeah. potentially. Okay. Uh, Mark Lowe, aye. Roy Epstein, aye. Elizabeth Dion, aye. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm gonna use the- Yeah, I have to get up the Zoom. Break. Break. I, I expect this will take 15 or 20 minutes. And we'll see. I know what you're getting paid. Did you close out of the meeting or are you staying in it? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to close out if, if I need close to. Close out, I, I assume I my computer is. It's going to run out of battery. Hibernated, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, find all my stuff. Turn the mic off.
Go ahead. Uh, Belmont, Media, Belmont Media, are you still here? Yes. Hi, sorry it took so long. Um, we, we can go back live and we'll just adjourn. Uh, well, we have to first move to leave. Yeah, leave executive session. So I move to-, uh, to Wait, uh, wait, are we, are we live? Um, yes. Sorry. Okay, I move that we um, leave executive session. Second. All in favor? Mark Lowe, aye. Roy Epstein, aye. Elizabeth Dion, aye. I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.